Every time they tell me stop, I use Every comment, hate that makes my feel Gather up my energy and boom I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with Giving my blood so I am relentless Well, we're here with Derek Wolf. All the way to Oregon from Colorado. That's like a two and a half hour flight. It's nothing. I know, but how badass is that you're here in my little hometown, Springfield, Oregon. It's beautiful here, man. It really the views here are incredible. Yeah. Seriously. Like I walked out into your driveway and was looking up into where those towers are. What you call right. that mountain? Yeah, the, the Cobra Hills over there. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Unbelievable. It's super green right now, too. The weather's perfect. Yeah. It's nice up here. Oh, it's uh yeah, I mean, these are about the perfect days. I think it was 80 some degrees today. Oh, it's you got a little sunburn. A little sunburn. It's all right, though. Yeah. I'll be okay. But what happens when you carry a rock? No. What about <laughs> what a great day? Dude, Live, we, run, shoot. It was so much. The concept is just incredible to me because most podcasts, you know, you show up and you just hang out, and talk, and whatever. But you, have, it's like interactive. Like I was like, I was thinking the other day, I was like, man, I was like, I hope I trained enough for this. <laughs> oh, like I hope yeah. I've been working out hard enough, you know, to to because I was worried you're gonna run me. Yeah, no. That's why no. I messaged you. Was like, hey, how far are we running? <laughs> yeah, He's like, don't understand. worry, you're carrying the rock. Yeah. And I was like, all right, cool. I, I could figured, do that. I figured that'd be in your wheelhouse. I mean, you're built for like carrying heavy shit, it looks like to me. <laughs> I mean, and you killed it. That it was rock fun. looked tiny. It was fun. It's heavy though. It really is. Like once yeah. you go a mile with it, you know, it starts getting pretty heavy. And it's awkward. It's not like you're just carrying it. You know, you got to put it on your shoulder. and Right. Or on your head. They're carrying on my head <laughs> on the way down. Derek carried it on his head, which I've never seen anybody do that. <laughs> Most people, their neck would be like. I don't know who knows what compressed, but 76 pound, <laughs> I know 76 pound rock on your head, man, giant, <laughs> you're, you're a big dude, but yeah, you, uh, I mean, what a great day. Picked you up at the hotel. We went and busted out the mountain. You carried the rock up and down, which nobody had ever done. Then we had of course French toast and bacon. Cause we had to do that. But all you, all, you also had six eggs. <laughs> and, uh, then what'd we do? We went to the bow rack. Yeah. And that was quick in and out. You made it easy on Wayne because you shot so much and you shoot well. So <laughs> yeah, he, you guys were all like, "Uh oh, <laughs> yeah, we got there." We, we you never know. Yeah, I you, mean, we've had all we've had people who've never shot a compound to people like you. Yeah, it's a well, that's the thing, man. You're you're introducing bow hunting to people that have never even thought about trying it, right? And just like their audience being able to see that, you know, because too many guys get a bad name for being a bow hunter, right? You get a bad name. You yeah. do because they they think we're just out there killing. Yeah, just flinging arrows. Just flinging shit. arrows at anything that walks by. Yeah. They don't realize what kind of goes into it. How much work goes into practicing? Mm -hmm. How much work goes into just getting a bow set up? Yeah, you know, it's yeah. a lot of stuff that goes into it. You know, all the measuring and making sure the draw length's right, making sure your arrows are right. You know, how many arrows did we screw up today? You know, they just. <laughs> I know. You know, it's like anything could go wrong out there. Yeah. So, um, and then and then what we do? We came back. Well, we went to Wayne's. And then we went to shoot and went and shot at Wayne's and I busted that record. Yeah, you did a <laughs> hundred. And I guess we were, I thought it was 131 or just under 131, but definitely over 130 yards. Yeah. Yeah. And it was interesting. Oh, it was awesome. <laughs> it was yeah. fun, man. I love doing stuff like that. Cause it's so fun. It's so hard to do. It People is. don't realize how hard, like 130 yards. You're like, Oh, it's not that bad. It's a poke. Yeah. You're aiming at the sky pretty much and sending it. So we had, I mean, just fun in the sun out there. And then you broke the record. Then we stayed and shot 3D targets there, shooting, trying to get tricky, shooting in the eye, shooting through the horn, shooting the... That one you shot through the horn at 60 yards. Yeah. I was impressed by that. I was like, <laughs> damn, that was impressive. Well, then you... You stuck one in what we had, the jackalope's ear. Yeah. Yeah. Stuck it right in his ear. Right in the We ear. both hit that one, though. Yeah. Yeah. But man, what a great day. <laughs> it was day. a good day, man. Yeah, then came back and did the old ice tub. Well, no, we got a lift in. Oh no, that's right. We lift you broke all the records in the gym too. We had a lot of we did a lot today. That was we a came full in here, day. busted the gym, moved all the weight. Yeah. But on dude, I'm impressed by your strength. I am. Oh, I don't know. Dude, 225, that's a lot more than you weigh. Mm -hmm. And you were busting those out for reps. Yeah. Oh. I don't know. Nothing compared to what you what you can do. I mean, dude, I'm th almost 300 pounds. It's like, <laughs> you're you know, a big boy. I'm, I played professional football. I move people around for a living. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, it's always impressive when like a smaller guy can move weight like that. It does. It impresses yeah. the hell out of me. Well, thank you. Um, and then, yeah, then we did in the, the ice tub. Yeah. 
Well, I needed that, and I felt great. I know it did. It brought me back to life. I was thinking about carrying the rock again. <laughs> hey, well, whatever you want to do. I'll be back. <laughs> You'll be back, yeah. I'll be back for that. Get back, break the rec- all every record out there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so here we are, and I guess how i don't know how we connected with i guess through bow hunting through social media yeah that's right? really how it happened um nobody introduced us you know we just no I just started like no i started noticing what you were doing and hearing more about it and seeing this wolf untamed hearing about that um of course knew you're gonna go on rogan listen to that listen to a few of your podcasts now i think i listened to um you were the go hunt guy or big hunt guys i think go hunt yeah go, go hunt, hunt. Um, and I heard a great story there about, I think, and I, you may have said it on Rogan too, about how killing a bull elk with a bow was a bigger thrill than sacking Tom Brady. Is yeah. That, is that what in you said? In the AFC championship. It yeah. was a bigger thrill than sacking Cam Newton in the Super Bowl. Really? I mean, nothing, I, there's nothing in my life that I could think of that was like, as far as like an adrenaline rush and like a thrill and like mm-hmm. a sense of accomplishment than killing my first bull. Yeah. And like putting my hands on him, I cried. Oh, like I don't cry really. You know, so like, yeah, I cried because I was so, I've been thinking about that since I was a kid, man. It's, it's like a dream of mine as a bow hunter. Anywhere, if you bow hunt, Mm -hmm. elk are the, that's like the pinnacle, you know? Right. And then once you kill an elk, then you're like, oh, big horn sheep. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, for me, I killed a bull, then I'm like, I need to kill another bull and another bull, another Mm -hmm. bull. Yeah. I've been like, bull. For some reason, I know everybody has their favorite species and different hunts they they prefer, but bull elk to me never get old. It's no, it's the it's the best hunt. They they respond back to you. Yeah, you know you can play mind games with them with the bugle tube. Yeah, and cow calls, and then you know it takes a lot of work because once you kill a bull, then you got to get him out of there. Yeah, and that's like to me that's the reward. I get to pack him out. I know. I, you know, I love even breaking down the bull after he's killed, yep. you know, getting him, deboning him. Yeah. And- doing, taking care of it, making sure like when I take the meat to the processor, I have a lot of pride in making sure that meat is clean, taken care of perfect condition. Um, I love that whole part of it, packing it out, keeping it clean, doing all, everything that I said. It's just, uh, it's just all part of the journey for me. And it's just, it never gets old. It's hard. It's fucking so hard. It's so hard. But it, I don't know. Every year that I, if I get one killed, I'm like, thank you, God, for one more bull. At least another season I got a bull elk down. Right. Because you can't take it for granted. No. It's, it's hard. It's hard, man. It, it really is hard. And people don't get that. I mean, they think you just walk out and step out of the truck. Yeah. And people that have never done it and don't really know much about it, they do. They think you walk out and you pull the bow back and fling an arrow. Yeah. They don't realize you're hiking miles and miles and miles. And you're not hiking on a trail. No. You're hiking through some blow down and all kinds of garbage. You might not see an elk. I know. Because you, there's no fir- way to tell. Your first one, didn't you go a few days? Oh, dude. I went three days straight. We went 50 miles in three days. And, and it was hell. Not one bull. Not, not one elk. Not one elk bugle. That's rough. I mean, we saw some turds. That, <laughs> we that, saw some elk turds and some that tracks. That test you how bad do you want it, right? Mm-hmm. And that's when I realized I love this. Like yeah. if I'm willing to do this and not see, not even see one, but then I was, I, I kind of did the, the over the counter in Colorado. Cause I felt like it's a rite of passage, you know, yeah. to go out and cut your teeth like that. Uh, it's not a lot of guys will go buy a landowner tag and yeah. make it easy. Yeah. But I was like, I don't know. I don't want to do it that way. I want to, I want it the hard way. Yeah. I want to see if I could kill one over the counter my first time. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, we're just out here hiking. We're not, <laughs> we're just, yeah. and it was fun, man. You know, hiking and you're, we were sleeping in like a sprinter van, you know, me and two other guys in this tiny little sprinter van, Yeah. <laughs> you know, stinking and smelling. And then, uh, I went down to New Mexico. We wall tented it, um, slept in a little cot and everything, but it was like, might as well have been a king bed by the time you get yeah. back from hiking all day. Have you ever stayed out? Like I used to call it bivouac hunting. I, th- I don't know if people still do, but where I'd have my bivy camp on my, on my back the whole time, everything I needed. And I just, wherever I ended up that day, I just camped there. Yeah. So, uh, so guys now call it spike, spike, hunting, yeah, spike, spike camp out. Yeah. So <clears throat> that was what we were going to do for the yeah. over the counter. hunt. Okay. But once we got up in there, we realized like, you know, what's a four mile hike to get up in here. Yeah. You know, it's not worth sleeping right. out in the woods, you know? Yeah. Might as well go sleep in a van. 
So yeah, we I just did that. So that was the plan. Yeah. So the first day, I had about sixty pounds on my back oh, hiking around, carrying everything you need. <laughs> I was yeah. Like, That'll worry. I was you like, out. don't need this, don't need this, don't need that. You know, yeah. I was like, get all this out of here. I you understand. know, so it was like, uh, then you, that makes you really appreciate these guys that go out spike in for yeah. days on end. They'll stay out there for fourteen days. Mm-hmm. And get it done. Yeah. You know, Aaron Snyder does stuff like that. South Cox. Mm-hmm. Those guys get after it. Yeah. And it's just, I got so much respect for that because it is not easy. Yeah, it is. It's hard. I think the, you know, like we were talking about that bull right there. That was, I killed that doing, you know, it was 12 miles from the trailhead. But it's, there's a little bit of an advantage. If you can get past the, the hurdle of being alone because a lot of people don't spend very much time alone. Yeah. I mean, it's tough, but if you can get past that and if you're strong enough or capable enough to carry your pack and all your camping gear on your back, it's you save energy because you're not going back and forth to a base camp. It's like wherever you end up that night, just bed down right there. You sleep, you wake. And what I found sleep when they sleep, sleep when they sleep, but also you, when you're out there, you can hear where they're at. So you hear those bulls bugling because you're laying there sleeping, the crisp cold air sound carries and you can middle of the night hearing bulls sight and they're not going to bugle during the day. So it can be a big advantage to being out there. Yeah. Even though being by yourself is rough for a lot of people. Yeah, it's rough. <laughs> it is. It is it's to go days on end. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've seen that show alone, right? Mm-hmm. Those guys lose their mind. They do. They freak out. They you, are thriving and you, they start freaking out because they're alone. And nothing has changed. It, they're creating these issues in their mind, yeah. essentially. Nothing's yeah. changed. You know, if you can just get <laughs> away from it and just be like, no, this is my life right now. This is all I'm worried about is do I have enough water? Do I have enough food? Where I'm going to hunt? That's it. Life yeah. is so simple. But we're not used to life being that simple. We're nah. used to being distracted all the time. Well, it's constant uh, stimulation. Yeah. You know, with screens and. Uh, phone call. Just, the cell phone has changed everything. You know, I, know. I w- I'm still young enough to, to, I'm still, I'm old enough now to know what it was like growing up without a cell phone. Right. You know, I didn't get a cell phone until I got to college. I so see. I know what it was like to not have one in high school. And I don't know, I think it like preserved my childhood a little bit, you know, not, not to have that because it still created human interaction. Mm-hmm. These kids nowadays, they got to text each other before they even like have a conversation face to face. I know. Like we I used know. to just get on our bikes and ride around and knock on people's doors and be like, Hey, can Johnny come out and play? And, you know, no, he's not home yet. Come back an hour later. Hey, is Johnny home yet? <laughs> yeah, I know. Back and that's kind of how it was. Yeah. I, but nowadays it's like, I'm not talking to them. I haven't even like texted them or yeah. DM'd them or anything. It's like, it's what? so weird. It's just so strange. I have a 16 year old. So like, it's yeah. just the teenager, the teenage like interaction socially is strange. Yeah, I know now. I, I mean, I think they're losing that. And that's especially like a, a sense of conversation or connection, like in a, a discussion like this. When does this ever happen in real life? You know what I mean? Not Sell much. Them. Not Sell much them. anymore. I didn't realize. I didn't realize how young you were because you said, I said, well, I killed that bull or I started boning in 89. And you said, well, that's longer than I've been alive. <laughs> you were born in 1990. <laughs> yeah. How crazy is that? It's wild. I didn't know. So how old are you? 35? 33. 33 god that's crazy and played in the nfl for 10 years and you're still only 33 yeah that's amazing i've lived a lot of life you have at 33 already man it's i uh, just super blessed man for for everything everything i went through it was all for a reason you know mm-hmm. it was all for a purpose to get me to prepare me for that those 10 years in the nfl yeah and even even during that career you went through a lot with injuries mm-hmm. and um, but it, it, like I was prepared for the adversity cause it's been like your since childhood. day one, since, since the, my earliest memories are like adversity. It's like getting through something. Yeah. Why? I mean, why do you think you, it, does it seem weird that you were subjected to so much basically pain and adversity, but were rewarded with your, your gifts and your talents to play in the NFL? Doesn't that, it's like the polar opposite. Well, it's like, it's funny because you say I was, I went through all this pain and adversity, adversity just to go through more pain and adversity <laughs> yeah. in the NFL, you know, but at least make money. doing. But at it. least I was getting paid to do it. So it was yeah. like, Hey, we got you, you know, the, the universe or God, whatever, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, higher being that you, you talk to, mm-hmm. 
there's a purpose. Everybody has a purpose. It's whether or not you're capable of finding that purpose. Right. Are you capable of finding something that you love to do? Mm -hmm. Because when you find it, you know, you know it, you know, it. you knew from a, you knew from the first time you stepped out in those woods and shot something yeah. with your bow that this is for you. Yeah, I did. You knew it. it. Did you know that when you started playing football? I knew it at seven years old. Teachers would lose their minds with on me because they'd be like, what are you going to do when you grow up? I'm going to play in the NFL. <laughs> and they'd be like, no, what are you really going to do? I'm going to play in the NFL. So you just knew. And they were just like, whatever. Like, yeah. They're like, you know how rare it is for a guy to make it in the NFL? And I'm like, whatever, dude. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Because a did. lot of kids do say they want to play in the NBA or NFL or whatever, but it is a pipe dream for most. It is. But for whatever reason, you were, you knew. I was gifted with size, mm -hmm. too, so I had the size. But there's a lot of big guys walking around that don't make it to the NFL. That's right. Because they don't have the ability and they don't have the mindset, and they weren't prepared the way I was prepared. And you think that, that all that turmoil prepared you for the grind of the NFL and it prepared my mindset hmm. because to play defensive line in the NFL at a high level, you know, you got to be fucked up. Yeah, you do. You have to be a savage. Why is, what do you mean fucked up? Because you're got two, 350 pound guys trying to move you. Mm -hmm. And then here comes Derrick Henry. Right. So you got to be like, you got to be ready for that shit. You know, you have to like go, you have to take yourself to a different place. Mm -hmm. And I was capable of doing that for a long time. It got a little more difficult once I had kids. Hmm. Like once uh, my my sixteen year old's my stepdaughter, but it was even then it was like coming home to be dad mm -hmm. after doing that for you know sixty plays straight. Yeah, you come home and you're just like, how do I turn this off? Right, it's like being being a gladiator fighting in the arena, then coming home and trying to be a, a loving father. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> it was like I found it to I found it getting harder and harder mm -hmm. to like turn it off yeah because i had to stay in it for because you got to go to practice too so you mm -hmm. got to keep that mentality once you go to practice you know because those guys are trying to they're trying to win their job too how how were you able to do it i mean you just you think it was just second nature because of how you grew up or did coaches yeah, I, help I didn't you? want i didn't how did it, like you mean flipping that switch on yeah just yeah just being like full bore all the time on the field yeah, it was I, great coaching. Yeah. Great coaching. Um, you know, great coaches always used to tell me that you practice like you play. Mm -hmm. Like you get, you know, John Fox was one that told me this. He said, you get paid to practice. The game is for fun. Right. Okay. And that was like, things like that, that resonates with me. Made sense. It makes yeah. sense to me. Mm -hmm. When you tell me something that makes sense, I'm all in. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. That means, okay, I'm going to grind and practice. That way when I get to the game, it's easy. What about... Would there be players who didn't want to grind like you wanted to grind in practice? Yeah, and they didn't they didn't do shit. Really? They get to the game and they just don't they're not a gamer. Yeah. Because they don't practice hard. And then those guys don't last, obviously. And they don't last. Because it's just a a money making machine, the NFL. Yeah, and there's I mean, think about how many colleges there are around the country. Mm hmm And now they have the they, not only that, now they have the international program where they're bringing guys in from all over the world. Mm hmm I mean, it's only a matter. They're as soon as they get you, they're trying to replace you. Right. So what are you doing to keep your job? What are you doing to stay there? Yeah. Peyton Manning told me one time, and I'd never forget it. He said, you either get better or you get worse. You never stay the same. Yeah. yeah. And if you think you're staying the same, you're probably getting worse. <laughs> because guess what? The other guy's working hard. Right. Whenever you're laying in bed at 6, 8 a.m., there's somebody that's been up since 5, grinding. How do you find the balance between pushing too hard and, and being smart about your body and recovering? So it's, it's, a, it's a fine line. Mm -hmm. It is. And I had great trainers because if it was up to me, I'll just keep going. Right. And I'll, and that's how you get hurt. You know, you get you injured yourself. So having great trainers, having a great routine, you know, like off days and rest, rest days for me, I still had to go do something. So it'd be like, I might not be grinding, but I'm doing something like functional movement or something like just mm -hmm. getting my hips opened up or stretching and doing this and that. But um, yeah, it, it's been a problem and coaches always tell you, you know, be the guy that we have to tell to slow down. Right. I, I always wanted to be that guy. I never wanted to be called lazy or mm -hmm. a loafer, or a, you know, somebody stood around the pile, this and that, you know, I wanted to be somebody that finished everything. Did any coach ever tell you to slow down? Yeah, they'll tell Yeah. Yeah, they do. And practice. Yeah. Yeah. You get a little too, <laughs> too wound get up. Get a little too wound up. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, chill out. Like we're just, you know, chill out. But you know, for the most part, they love that, you know, that's what mm -hmm. they want. But coaches, 
coaches aren't going to tell you to slow down usually. That's just not going to happen. Yeah, because they want. They, I was curious because you have to. It, it'd be like on in private, you know. But, mm-hmm. Hey, chill out. Like you don't need to do all that. Yeah, <laughs> like, I can't, I'm sorry. I don't know what else. No, because if, if they announced it at the field and the guys who weren't trying like you were trying, it's like, oh, yeah, we need to slow down. So then they weren't even achieving what they should have and yeah. they're scaling it back. And that's how I, le- I tried to lead that way. That's I tried to lead with my work. Mm-hmm. You know, let, uh, all that talking and rah-rah doesn't mean shit if you aren't doing it. Were you a vocal person? So you weren't that vocal? More, more like action, speak louder than During words. the game, I would be vocal. Hmm. So I would like get I would get on people's ass during the game. Like... Um, like- your, and like your a, teammates? Yeah, get on their ass, you know what I mean? Because it's like, you know, I'll give you an example. I was in Baltimore, and we have, like, one of the best defensive backs in the league. And we stopped the – we were playing Dallas. And we stopped Zeke on the goal line three times in a row. Mm-hmm. I made the play all three times. And then on fourth down, they let him throw a touchdown. And I freaked out. I got yeah. to the sign, I was like, if he runs through my fucking gap, that's on me. Yeah. If you go, I was like, you got to cover these assholes. Let's go, you know? Right. And they all responded. They were like, you're right. He's right. Yeah, that is. I was right. You that know? is de- uh, deflating to, to stuff them three times in a row. Then so Just to have him throw a little dump pass to a <sighs> wide open guy that they just didn't cover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it's if you get beat, you got beat. Right. Whatever. I'm cool with that. But a mental error in, this, in, a, in a situation like that? No. Was it your best DB who got beat? I don't know whose fault it was. Oh, I, yeah. I just was yelling at them all. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> and it, but they responded to it. You know what yeah. I mean? They were like, I wasn't like being insulting or anything. Right. I was just like letting yeah. them know that I'm showing passion. Passionate. Yeah. Like if I didn't give a shit, I just come over and be like, oh, whatever. You know, I'm getting right. paid regardless. Yeah. You know, but yeah, I care. I want to win. I understand. Yeah. Um. So what happened with that game? We won. Did you? Yeah, we won. Okay. And we like had a nice lead anyways. So <laughs> that was, you were with, uh, Baltimore, Baltimore yeah. at that time. Oh yeah. Okay. So you it was, said like, that it was in 2020. Okay. Yeah. So it was a you, COVID year. So we're playing games without fans. It's already like, so you got to bring your own energy, man. Yeah. There isn't 80,000. So there aren't 80,000 people out here screaming. No. You want to talk about weird. Yeah. Lining up against Cleveland that first game. Not a single fan. Not uh, one. Did it feel like practice? Yeah. Yeah. You could hear everything the quarterback was saying. Baker Mayfield's back there making all these calls. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> I can hear everything he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is strange. Who won that game? We won. Yeah. Yeah, we won that game. Was Baker any good? He was pretty good. Yeah. He was surrounded by a lot of good players, too. Okay. I think that it just didn't work out there. You know, he just wasn't the guy. No, they had, like, Nick Chubb. They had a pretty good running back really good for running a while. Back. Nick yeah. Chubb is really good. Yeah. I mean, he Dude, was, he is good. He's hard to tackle, man. And then, yeah, I was kind of, I was always, for whatever reason, sort of a Baker fan. I don't know why. Just I like, he's like a good his dude. personality. I like his personality. I got to meet him a couple times and talk, playing against him. He's like always chirping. Yeah. You know what I mean? But he's like shows respect whenever, you know, you make a good play. Yeah. Like to me, that's, I don't know. I love that out of a guy. And he reminded me of Brett Favre a little bit too. Did so. he? Like just like just style. a gunslinger, like he's just out there trying to make plays, and yeah, he had out attitude in college, so right, um, you know. And then he goes to what happened last year when he goes to L.A. I know that's uh, what I was and learns the say. playbook and just blows people out. Yeah, he won his first game, didn't he? he yeah, his first start. He was something? there for twenty four hours. Mm. He was on the plane right out there reading the playbook. Like, yeah, dude, that's amazing. Show, that's different, man. Not everybody can do that. You no, know? that was cool. That was a pretty fun game. But then I think the next game he came out and didn't do anything and they lost. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to sustain that. Well, that's that. the thing about the NFL, man. And yeah. I try to tell people this. The game planning, and so we used to call this, this thing FBI. It's called football intelligence. Mm. And we also had, like, we had, like, the CIA guys that would watch the film, watch the watch the TV copies, and pick up on, like, vocalization of what this play is and what that play is and what this formation means. So it's easy to get a read on a guy. Yeah. So like by the end of the season, you got the team figured out. Right. So you've been game planning again. Your scouts have been game planning all year and getting things ready for coaches to like go and go through and look at it. And then a new quarterback comes in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that's all out the window. Yeah. You don't know what you're going to get. And that's why he was able to come in there first game and show him something different. Right. You know, they had a different game plan than they've used all season. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's why it's tough to beat a team twice in one year. Right. Because they've got you figured out. Who is the best at game planning, do you think? I mean, when, anytime I think about being prepared, I always think of Tom Brady. 
Dude, Peyton Manning was incredible. Really? Incredible. Yeah. The way he could read a defense and set a defense up. So he, yeah, he just knew the ins and outs of the game so well yeah. and knew tendencies and did his homework and could see guys probably cheating one way maybe yeah. or eyes looking one He'd way. He would use his eyes. He would yeah. use his eyes to bring safeties off and then wide open. Yeah. But Tom Brady does it. He's the same way. It's the right. same thing. You don't win seven Super Bowls. <laughs> Dude, it's been seven Super Bowls. I know. Won them all. That's crazy. And think of if imagine if he won those two against Eli, you know? Yeah, I know. But he yeah. almost won. So what he what he went to ten and won seven, is that what it was? Yeah. God. Yeah. That, that's great. I played ten years. That's amazing. He went to ten Super Bowls. I it know. just blow it blows my mind, man, for how long he played and at such a high level. And then, you know, just to stick it to Belichick, him to go to go and to win Tampa and one. win another one. Crazy on a team that hadn't won anything. I know. <laughs> it's so crazy. Long. Awesome. Yeah. And awesome. Still- awesome competitor too. Yeah. Did Did you know him well? I didn't know him well, but I played against him a lot. Yeah. And yeah. We had there was a mutual respect there. Right. Because I was on his ass. <laughs> I was on him. You know, I was yeah. trying to get him every time. I got in my rookie year, and I was like, "Holy shit! I just sacked Tom Brady." You know. You remember? Was that what game was that? Like oh, one of the I don't first know. Like games? A, my first game was the first game of the season against the Steelers. And I got I got Ben Roethlisberger. You nice. understand? I grew up in Pittsburgh. All everybody that grew up around me, are Pittsburgh Steelers fans. Yeah. So I know they were rooting against me. That was a big one. So I was like, I'm about to go out here and kick his ass. Let's go. Yeah. And I got Big Ben down, and then um, he's tough to bring down. Wasn't he's tough he? Tough to bring down, man. He is tough. And then I got and the last game that I played against the Steelers when I was with Baltimore, I went up to him and talked to him and everything. And he was, I was like, Hey, man, I want. I know I've never asked anybody for a jersey, mm. but I wanted one from him. Yeah. And he was like, all right, I'll send you one. And I was like, he's not going to send me one. <laughs> and he did, man. He did signed, he? Yeah, he signed, a, he signed it, like personalized it for me and wrote me something nice. It was cool. That's great. He's a good dude. Yeah, yeah he's a good dude. He's a solid And he guy. bow hunts. And he bow hunts. He loves deer hunting. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I mean, you know, you, you t- saying that sacking Tom Brady or uh, sacking Cam, was it Cam Newton? Yeah, in the, in the Super, Bowl, Super Bowl. It doesn't compare to bow hunting. It reminds me of, I remember I took Joe on his first elk bow hunt in Colorado and we had two bulls coming in and he was so wound up that he, he said, I mean, he's done, you know, live UFC, uh, comedy, all these stressful, you know, his podcast, of course, that's second nature to him, but all these very stressful fighting. And he said nothing compared to when those bulls were coming in. Nothing compares to it. Well, I showed you that video of my first bull coming in. He's just ripping bugles. Right. It's like Jurassic Park, man. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing compared. Honestly, I can't think of one thing. The birth of my daughter, my youngest daughter, like watching that happen was intense. (laughs) Like, I was like, oh, like. Yeah. But it was a different kind of focus. Yeah. Being out there and like seeing a 900 pound bull elk just raking and ripping through the the trees and Mm -hmm. ripping bugles. And then you're at full draw. It was like, Oh, I really got a foot. Like normally it just comes like that flow state just comes to me. I had to really like, Oh, okay. Calm down. Yeah. Chill out, relax. Yeah. And it was like, everything just slowed down. And I was like, laser focused on him right behind that shoulder and just was it 42 or 46? 42 yards 42 yeah dropped it right in behind the shoulder and i knew it was a good shot just because i could see the arrow yeah Did you call the away. bull in yeah we called him in and then was he i couldn't was he quartering two a little bit or, or broadside he was perfectly broadside perfectly for me. Broadside. the camera on the camera angle it looks like he's a little quarter a little bit quarter two yeah but i but, was like but you just smoked him i smoked him yeah and I was like, I was so happy. I was just shaking on the, on the video. If you guys look at my, my YouTube, you'll see me at the end. I'm just like, oh shit, that yeah. was awesome. You know? Yeah. It was so intense. And then oh. the pack out, man, like it was just going down there, put my hands on him. It was incredible. I just, I grabbed him and I was just like, I had a second of myself where, mm. you know, my, my buddy Levi wasn't beside me and, uh, and Braxton wasn't with me. It was just us three. And I had my hands on him and I just like just tears started running out of my eyes and then levi can't levi mayfield he's my camera guy great guy he comes around just gives me a big hug he's like i'm so proud of you man good job because we grinded for five days for that bull you know it was yeah. the fifth day what was it what was the tears just like that- it was like that uh i didn't cry when i won a super bowl dude like, yeah i did i was it was happy tears i was happy did you cry when your daughter was born yeah oh, okay yeah 
<laughs> you're gonna get in yeah. trouble if you did yeah i did i cried <laughs> I, I and she she still does things that like bring tears to my brings yeah. tears to my eyes because like I, you know i didn't love, have right well like the unconditional love that she shows me like mm-hmm. when i walk in the door every day she's like dad comes and jumps on me like that makes me want to cry like oh, somebody's happy to see me you know mm-hmm. like she's happy to see me and then like i love you daddy you know like that just brings tears to my eyes man because she is is it because unconditional love she loves me unconditionally do you think that's that the reason why that impacts you is because you didn't have that so long exactly. growing up exactly because how many times did you walk into a house and have some people you know excited to see you yeah <laughs> i walked in the house and got choked <laughs> mm-hmm. choke slammed or punched or you know kicked or drug around you know as i was telling my stepdaughter um because i i'm teaching her how to drive mm-hmm. and i was like hey you got to wake up a little earlier if we're going to, you're going to drive to school. Cause like you're driving the speed limit. Okay. So like, we're not speeding to school. Like when I drive. Right. And she's like, okay. So I go and wake her up the one morning and I was like, Tatum, listen, cause she was like, you kind of were aggressive this morning. And I was like, <laughs> all I said was sweetheart, you got to get up. That's yeah. all I said. And she was like, it was kind of aggressive. And I was like, sorry. I was like, <laughs> but you know how I got woken up. Right. I was like the blanket got ripped off of me and I got ripped out by my ankle and landed mm-hmm. on the floor. Like yeah. that's how I got woken up. So I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> if you had a little too much emotion in what you said. Yeah, no, I understand. I mean, yeah, I mean, it is, it is different, but you want your kids to know what that feeling of love is exactly. and, and like, and they do. And then they reciprocate when you walk in, they're excited to see you. And yeah, it probably is emotional because of everything you went through mm-hmm. in life, just looking for something like that. Yeah. Even if you would never say, I want somebody to love me, people do. You know what I mean? People always do, but it's just like, it's uh, there's no guarantee you're ever going to get it. Well, as a, as a boy, there's like a little boy, there's nothing like a mother's love. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what that, I didn't, I don't know what that is. What is that unconditional love that they're going to, a mother will love their, is supposed to love their son no matter what. Right. But I didn't feel that love from my mom. I believe that she did love me. She just didn't know how to love. Mm-hmm. Like she didn't know how to love either. She came from an abusive home as well. So. Um, she had her own, her own struggles, but she just didn't break that chain. You know, she didn't break the cycle. It wasn't important to her to break that cycle. But to me, it was important to break that cycle. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, even, you know, people argue and there's going to be, if you live with someone, you're going to argue sometimes. So like when we have an argument, I do my best. I'm like, I'm not going to raise my voice no matter what. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do everything I can not to raise my voice. And try not to argue around my kids and try to let them see what a man is, how a man is supposed to love their wife. Mm -hmm. Because they're going to, those girls are going to marry a man that emulates me. Right. I mean, that's what they're going to see, how I treat their mom and Mm -hmm. how, you know, no matter what they like, no matter what. And my wife tells me all the time, she's like, no matter, no matter how, no matter how frustrated you get with her, don't yell at her. Right. Because sometimes I'll be like. Roxy, like I'm yelling, Roxy, get her name's Roxy, my right. youngest. I'm like, Roxy, get in here because she just plays games with me because she knows I won't do anything, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, Roxy, and she's like, don't don't yell at her because she's going to think it's okay for people to yell at her. And I'm like, mm. okay, yeah. Yeah. Roxy, Roxy, come here, babe. Like, and I have to like <laughs> get her to look at me and then I explain to her why it's important to listen. And yeah. I didn't get that as a kid. I never understood why I was in trouble. I just right. knew that I did, I was bad. Right. It was my fault. Everything was your my fault, you know? Mm hmm. And I, but I was smart enough to know that it was all bullshit. They were just taken out. They were frustrated with themselves. They took it out on me. So I'm not going to do that with my kids. Yeah. I'm going to break that cycle. They're going to know what love is when it's, you know, when my daughter wakes up at, you know, four in the morning, cause she had a nightmare, I'm going in there and I'm going to lay with her. Mm-hmm. If that's what she wants, I'm going to do it because that's what I'm her dad. I'm right. supposed to. Yeah. I mean, it's good. You have that perspective and you've been through so much to where you know what, this stuff's pretty good. Is it? I'm serious. I yeah, like it. Yeah. So yeah, we tried the black Buffalo here. What do you got there? The long cut, long cut wintergreen, man. It's pretty good. So that's supposed to have the same feel as like your normal stuff, right? It feels does, like a normal chew. Does it's it? It's got nicotine in it. It's it just doesn't have all the garbage. So you're going to, you're going to endorse black Buffalo here on this podcast. I'm going to endorse this product. Okay. All right. Well, it's well, approved. Yeah, and it's, I mean, for those looking to to get off of chewing tobacco and yeah. a more healthy al- alternative, that's supposedly the ticket. 
like I said, I, I have never been tough enough to chew because anytime I've tried, I've got sick. So <laughs> you're I, lucky. I didn't have to worry about being addicted to it. Um, but yeah, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad they're part of the podcast. Cause I know a lot of people do like the guys who I used to work with and would supervise a lot of them chewed and you know, man, if they can do something a little more healthy, I'm pumped. So I'm glad you like it. Yeah. My daughter calls it trash. What's the trash in your mouth? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what she says to me. It's And what so, do you say? I'm just like, it's a bad habit. Daddy's mm -hmm. got a bad habit and I'm going to try to quit. Yeah. And yeah. I never, so now every time she sees me with one, and I thought you were going to quit. Yeah. Three-year-old saying that to me, <laughs> hold me accountable already. Um, I was, how did, how did you go from like that broken home type situation to be in, to hunting. Cause it seems like if you're in a, a broken home, hunting is like a man, that's like a hobby. You know, people normally people do that are more, a little more squared away. Like, cause their yeah. dad takes them or something yeah. like that. Well, my that. stepdad did take me. Okay. He would take me. I, I can count on my, on one hand, how many times he took me, but mm -hmm. he introduced it to me. Yeah. You know, he also signed me up for football. You know, mm -hmm. he was the guy that signed me up for football. So, I mean, he had, a, he served a purpose. Yeah. Um, but he did, he would take and his idea of hunting was, I was like the, I was like the bird dog, you know, just run into that brush and stuff. flush some yeah. pheasant out of there or something, you know, <laughs> yeah. there was never anything in there. <laughs> like one time I think it worked really. Yeah. And yeah. then, uh, like the deer hunts, he would go to his buddy's property and he'd be like, sit under this tree. Don't move. Yeah. Freezing cold, had steel toed boots on. That's right. I sat there and shivered for two hours and then he came and got me. It's kind of like my stepdad who I, you know, hated growing up and I'm sure he hated me too, but he got me started hunting because my dad didn't hunt. <laughs> he was an athlete and a coach here in town. He never, he, he said when you'd hunt, if you killed something, you lost brain cells. So that was his thoughts on hunting. But my stepdad who had no use for, he, he did take me hunting and that's what, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because that's how I got started also. Yeah. It's wild, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can take, I, I say in my book, it's like the the hero can, or the villain can turn out to be the hero, you know, in certain stories in certain ways. And, uh, um, you know, without being introduced to hunting, maybe, maybe we would never have met or right, we connected or, but this whole journey and maybe football, I mean, since he got you signed up for football. So yeah, I mean, I guess you can take the good with the bad on some of that. Right. Yeah. It, I mean, it's all perspective too. Mm -hmm. It's like, it could, somebody always, somebody's always got it worse. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? So like I, you could, you could feel sorry for yourself or you can, you know, take your licks and realize that it's not forever. Right. And you can change your stars. Mm -hmm. Like what's written is not forever. It could be erased and you can change it. You can change your outcome. Yeah, for sure. And so you started, he got you started on the hunting journey and then you just kind of dabbled in it until while well, you were playing. I didn't, or? I didn't just dabble in it. When I was a teenager, when I was like 13, 12 to like 15, 16, mm -hmm. I was like obsessed with killing big bucks. Really? I wanted to kill a big buck so bad. And I remember the first deer, I, the first buck I ever killed was just a little spike, mm -hmm. you know, like two little prongs sticking yeah, up. Yeah, That was my first buck too. But he came in and I was in a climber. I, well, I went up there in the woods by myself, Really? hooked that thing up to the tree, climbed up 25 feet and sat there on the edge of a field. Mm. And he came walking down the trail and I was like, it was early in the morning. I probably should have waited. How'd you know where to set up? I just, I, it's like, I don't know. To me, it's like an instinct thing. Yeah. Like you just thought on the this edge of looks the field. like yeah. the night before I'd walked through there and I was like, this looks like a good spot for deer to come through. Did you look for tracks or anything? Yeah. There was yeah. deer, tra big, heavy deer trail okay. that had been moved on. And I was like, who knows if it's doe or buck, like if they're right. doe moving, yeah. it's November. There's probably a buck coming through here. So that first buck that came through, he got, he was 14 yards, dude. I stuck him and I watched him lay down and Your I first was, buck was a bow kill. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Who's bow? It was just my, it was the farm I was hunting on. It was his brother, bigger brother's bow. His okay. older brother, it barely fit me. Like Real. we went to the bow shop and got it fitted for me and stuff. And I okay. just used what he had. Yeah. And, uh, cause I didn't have any money, you know, and just couldn't mm -hmm. buy anything. So it was a PSE, old PSE and it had, got the job done. Yeah. I mean, so you stuck the deer and it laid down and died. It there? laid down 14 yards from where I shot it. Wow. Cause I measured it. I was like, you must have hit it. That good. was like the thing back then, you know, like how far did he go? <laughs> yeah. You must not have hit him good. You yeah. know, if he went too far, he went, oh, you went more than 20. You, you didn't hit him good, you know? Right. But I did. I hit him good. Perfect. Do you remember the arrows or broadheads or anything? No, I have no idea. Just was some just, expandables probably. Just something that they had with the yeah. bow. <laughs> well, something that he had sitting around, you know, yeah. that, 
that I could shoot. So I did that. And then we, I killed a, my first Turkey out there with him. Hmm. Um, that was awesome. And then, uh, just like random, like what happened was like, you just, you go get into high school and then you're playing football and you're wrestling and you're training for all that. It's just like, you get to go out every now and then, but the chances of seeing something, if you just go out one time is not good, you know? Right. So I always found, a, I found an opera. I always found like solace in being out in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So just being in the woods by myself with the quiet was always like peaceful to me. That was right. like, that's my church, you know? So I found some kind of peace doing that. So I would always find time to just go sit in the woods. Who knows if I'm going to see anything. Mm -hmm. So I would just go sit. And then I, like I said, I'd come back for bye weeks and, Sometimes I'd get a stick one and sometimes I wouldn't, you know, that was in Ohio. Yeah. I just go back to Ohio and do it. And because I just didn't understand the rules out West. Like, right. I was like, what is all this draw stuff? What does that mean? Yeah. I was like, I'm used to being able to go to Walmart, buy a shotgun and a Turkey tag and go hunt. You know, mm -hmm. that's kind of how it was, uh, buy some slugs and get a deer tag if you want, you know, that's just the way it was. It was, it was easy, but out West with these units and I, it just was like a whole nother language to me. Yeah. I just didn't understand it. So then I get to the league and I would go do like, I was finally able to afford a good bow. Hmm. So I went and got a good, bought a good bow and would do some hog hunting and some uh, actual spear hunts at? down in Florida. Okay. Down in Florida. I actually did the first hog hunt down there with a spear. Really? Yeah. Did you get one? <laughs> yeah. Nice. With dogs? Yeah. We had dogs. We just running through them palmettos with the dogs. Oh man. And the dogs like head butted the pig and got him by the ear and I just ran up there and rah. <laughs> It's pretty intense. It was really intense. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because this is a kind of an intense story, but I had a buddy with me and he's like, I'm doing mine with a knife. And I'm like, all right, bud. Yeah. <laughs> they get the thing down and he stabs it too low. Uh oh. So next thing you know, he's elbow deep in this pig. Oh, God. And he's like trying to get it up to its like vitals, you know? And it's the sounds coming out of that thing, man. Oh. And he's an animal, like, you want to talk about an animal lover? Like, I love animals. Love yeah. them, right? Like, I appreciate animals. I love them. I don't, not just killing indiscriminately. Yeah. But those pigs are a problem. They got to take care of them. Like, mm -hmm. why not? But he doesn't do that. Like, he'll save snakes mm -hmm. and spiders and stuff. Like, he's like yeah. that guy. So is he traumatized by Dude, that we're kill? we're in a car, and I look back, and I'm like, his name was, we, his nickname was Cubby. I'm like, Cubby, you all right? He goes, why'd you bring me here? <laughs> And I was like, you all right? He's like, don't ever bring me to something like this again. This he was dead. after he killed yeah. it? Because it got so messy. It, it was intense, yeah. yeah. He's like, I feel like I just killed a human. Yeah. These are 300-pound, 250-pound pigs, you know? It was like he murdered the pig. <laughs> he did. <laughs> I mean, it was like a brutal. It was yeah. so brutal. I felt bad for the pig, man. I was like, oh. You know, I, uh, my, <laughs> my other son, Truett, he did that in Hawaii, too. And he, he had the video of it, and I'm just like, don't show that to anybody because <laughs> it is like a murder. It's just like, okay, that's a little, it's, it's a little much, it's you know what much, I mean? Man. To be, to be stabbing something. <laughs> it's just like, I get it. Cause I know they do it and it is, I mean, they do it in Texas. They do it in Hawaii. They do it, you know, where you guys were in Florida, but yeah, it's a, it's a different level. It's different, different man. kind of hunting. Yeah. It's, I don't know. <laughs> it's like them dogs start barking. Yeah. They stop the swamp, the swamp buggy. <laughs> He said, get your spear. Let's go. Let's the dogs out. And we just take off running, chasing the dogs. Through yeah. These palmettos getting ripped up. He said to wear jeans. I was wearing shorts and a cutoff. Oh, man. You know? And it, it was it was just intense, man. And I, I had, it was fun, you know. And then we went and shot and chased after Axis deer. Ended up mm -hmm. getting one. Um, I think I got one that year. I don't know. It took me like two years of hunting Axis to finally put a stock on one and get it. They're They're fast. Well, they're, they'll jump the stream. They're switched on. I for missed sure. a, a bunch. Yeah. I like, thought I was good. And like, they just like completely turn the other way running. I know. By the they, time the arrow gets there. I remember Joe sent me this video. I wasn't with him, but he shot at this giant buck in Lanai and, uh, arrow just flying. Perfect. Perfect. He's just like, he's going to smoke this thing. And then right before he gets there, it's like that thing was gone. Not even close to getting hit by the arrow. Yeah, not even close. I mean, just kind of stood there for a while and just was watching the arrow come and then just like, okay, I'm gone. <laughs> I mean, so quick. <laughs> the quick twitch is like out of there. Oh, it's incredible. But yeah, that, I saw so I would do that kind of hunting. Um, and then finally, um, what really reignited it like heavily for me was when I went back to Baltimore. Mm. Cause I was already like kind of preparing for, you know, to, to hunt. But when I went to Baltimore, the deer hunting there is phenomenal. Mm. Like there are deer everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I got to really practice, 
you know, the only way to get good at killing deer is to practice yeah. killing deer, you know, kill. with a bow. Yeah. You can shoot at targets all day, but like until you shoot at something that's alive, right? You're not going to get better. It's like to me, it's like football. The only way to get good at football, to get in shape for football, is to play football. Mm -hmm. So I got to hunt. I mean, the one 2020, I think I killed, I don't know, eight or nine deer. And then 2021, it was like 17 deer. Really? Because you get unlimited doe tags. And, and then, then, and you, so you go into these like residential areas. Oh. And, uh, the company called trophy line hooked it up for me and they sent me a tree saddle that they thought would be like sturdy enough for me. Yeah. And it was, I felt safe in it. I could hang upside down in that thing. Nice. And I was like, okay, cool. So you go into these, I call them backyard bucks. Yeah. You go in these backyards pretty much where it's like, there's some good ones, 10, 15 acres. And there's some, I mean, some one forties, one fifties, like it's good deer, some nice bucks. Yeah. But a lot of dough and the landowner's like, please, can you get rid of some of these does? And so is it unlimited does? Unlimited. Yeah. Unlimited. And then I had um, a couple of crop damage permits. Okay. So I go sit these soybean fields and just. Did other just guys come with you? Yeah, I'd have I'd have a guy. Um, we would do deer drives with my bow. Okay. He would take a, He would go up there, park his truck, and drive his quiet drive the quiet cat down through the woods, throwing Put, sticks and making yeah, noise, and getting them, and pushing them down. And then because um, you have to clear them out. No, just a oh. uh, just a buddy that lived there. Um, but you have to do it because mm. they're like. They, they get diseases and they starve. And um, then we, the good thing is, is we have, uh, they have these trucks that drive around Baltimore that will pick up deer meat and serve it to the uh, homeless. Okay. So, so you, can donate, you can donate it. Yeah. It kills. Yeah. Who can eat 16 deer? You know? I know. Well, and those guys, the homeless, they don't get protein, you know? I mean, so anytime like those, I know I've given a lot of meat to homeless shelters and they can make, if it's protein, they can make it into tacos and spaghetti and easy serve stuff. Yeah. So if you can mass all, all this mass stuff, produce. yeah, that has protein with it, that's going to last these, these homeless people a while. So yeah, that's a great, I mean, great thing to do with those kills for sure. But, but that reignited it. So that okay. reignited the passion. Gotcha. Cause I love it. Like I absolutely loved it as a kid and it reignited. <clears throat> and I was like, Oh man, I really want to hunt some elk. Mm -hmm. Like elk hunting. It was just like something I dreamed about as a kid. Like, I saw it on like the outdoor channel or something one time. But it and seemed unattainable. Probably. Yeah. It's yeah. like, I, I never, I didn't fly on a plane till my freshman year of college. Hmm. So I don't even know, like, what is this going to look like? Right. So finally I'm like, okay, when I retire, that's the first thing I'm doing in September as I'm elk hunting. Yeah. And I got that opportunity. The retirement came up. I was, I'd played 10 years. I was like, it's time. I had to get double hip surgery. Hmm. So I had both hips done. That was a, a six month recovery on the right one and a four month on the left one. So about 10 months of recovery and then doing rehab. And finally I was like, okay, I think I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I think I'm good. And I went out there and it was tough. Like it was, I had to, I had to, you know, cut my teeth in on that first hunt. Yeah. But I went down to New Mexico, man. And I, I'm hooked. Full yeah. blown addict, <laughs> full blown psycho That's, addict. It's pretty amazing to go that quick. I mean, I guess it, it's, you're in a good area and then with good people too, but it's pretty amazing to go the first time and kill a bull. Well, the first time I went, I didn't see a bull. Right. Was it the but when same I went, year? Yeah, same, same year. year. It was a week apart. Right. So it's just, yeah, but it's still first year hunting elk. That's yeah, I impressive. got to, I got to put, yeah. Yeah. Because even, but it was a target rich environment. I'll tell you that. Like it's, I guarantee you go to unit 34 in New Mexico. It's like Jurassic Park in there, dude. It's like, <laughs> which, where do we go? You know, yeah. Bugle here, bugle there. Like they're all over the place. Oh, that's incredible. It's loaded and it's yeah. public land. It's, you know, it's loaded though. It's, and it's a hard, like, it's just hard to draw those tags. You know, the right. percentage is so low. And you, you bought a landowner or what was it? Yeah. That? My wife got me one for my, uh, right. Okay. For my retirement. For, well, it was like a retirement slash Christmas present. Okay. It's an expensive tag. Yeah. You know, but I was like, I was like, yeah, sweet. Let's do it. You know, well, it was like 10 grand. It was like 15, 15, yeah, yeah. 15 grand. And then after you pay for the guide fees and everything, you're, you know, you're in it for like 24,000. Yeah. I know. And then the one I bought this year, um, I lucked out and got it for the same price, but in a way better unit. So really? 16 a in the Gila. Oh man. That's going to be, it's sweet. going to be so amazing. I can't wait. Like I'm, <laughs> oh, yeah. and then I drew my Montana tag. So, so you got two elk hunts this year. I might have three because I have another landowner tag on my property in Colorado. Whoa. So I might have three elk tags. Could you imagine killing three bulls? I might. I mean, I might just quit now. <laughs> no, I'll never quit. I'll be doing this till I can't walk. I know. I mean, it, it's just you get addicted to that 
to just being out there and just like being testing there. your wits and like seeing these animals in their natural environment, basically. And they look, I don't know. I never get tired of seeing big bulls. It's just like, they're the, the most amazing animal. Yeah. That's when I walked in here, I was like, it was like, Oh, like all these giant bulls everywhere. The taxidermy is just incredible in here, man. It's so cool. This is such a cool job. I'd never leave. <laughs> I was, you know, this is doesn't even seem real to me to have. I still feel like I played football at Southern Oregon State, so we lived in the in the dorm room just for football players. And I was such a, a small town redneck that in my and I had a, a bunk mate to in the same tiniest room ever. But on my side where the bed was, I had what I called the cycle. I because I killed the cycle, and it was a. A uh, spike buck, a four gunner buck, a three point, and a four by four. And so that was like hitting for the cycle in baseball, you know, yeah. that single, double, triple home run. So I, I had all those up on my wall, just kind of nailed through the skull to the <laughs> wall. And that was the cycle of deer. And people would come in and be like, what, what is, what's this all about? And I'm like, that's a cycle. I killed all those. So yeah, I mean, it's like, I, I know that's what I'm kind of used to that little rinky dink redneck type thing this type of stuff doesn't even seem real to yeah me. it's 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 incredible man i mean I, i've killed them but doesn't seem those bulls from arizona are yeah. unreal no uh, i know it's uh yeah there there's i don't think there's any better place for big bulls than san carlos indian reservation and it's just you know 1.8 million acres and it's um it's just there's there's places with more elk but I don't think bigger elk. Right. It's, it's, you're not the first person to tell me that either. Oh, it's a, like a, a dream come true to be there. And then plus that is that it's, you know, a reservation. So the, the, that there's some native American type history and the tradition and you just, can probably feel it, right? It just feel, yeah, it feels different to me to be in those mountains. It just feels so special. Yeah. And to, to be see, invited in there. Right? right. You know, I know. And then to see these animals, the biggest in the world is just like unreal, <laughs> unreal. But you know, for you to have three elk hunts this year, potentially three elk crazy. hunts, two deer hunts. Cause I got a Colorado Eastern plains hunt for a uh, mule deer. Mm -hmm. And then I, that combo tag in, in Montana. Yeah. Deer and elk. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, hopefully I get that white, I draw that white tail in Kansas because I drew it last year and I went there and got my butt kicked. So really I'm coming back. Kansas is like a good whitetail state too. Unbelievable. We're not seeing I anything. I saw the biggest bucks I've ever seen, like whitetail. Cause they grew up in Ohio, big whitetail bucks. Yeah. You know, you see big ones in Ohio, mm -hmm. like, you know, just down the road from where I grew up, they killed two, they killed, killed two, 200 inch bucks off the same farm. Yeah. Wow. So there's big ones there. Giant. But I just never see them. Yeah. Cause you have to hunt them hard. Mm -hmm. So to, to have an opportunity in Kansas, I mean, I saw some giant deer. And what happened? They just, they were out of range. They just skirted me. I wasn't, Yeah. You know I mean, I just, I tree went in, stand. I was in a tree saddle. Yeah. Tree saddle. Tree saddle. And then I just, I don't, I won't sit corn. I won't do it. It's yeah. not fun to me. Can you bait them there? Yeah. Okay. But I don't want to sit corn yeah. because I don't want to deal with all the does hanging around. <laughs> yeah. Like, I want to be able to move a little bit, you know, like yeah. those does come in and they just start. Those does will be the, bring the bucks. I know. <laughs> I know. I want to catch. I want to catch those bucks moving. Though, yeah, you know I what I mean. Let me catch them on a pinch point or yeah, you know, a transition area, like yeah. something like that. You know, to me, that's like real hunting. You know, yeah, and I'm not nothing against guys sitting corn. There's no, guys. I understand. There's guys back in Ohio. They sit the same corn pile every year. Yeah, all year. We'll probably and kill, kill a big 170, 180 buck every year. Yeah, I. Uh, there's a white tail back there in the corner, but I killed in in eastern Colorado and stocked it in the Milo. And so that's probably what you'll be hunting, like Milo, yeah. mm -hmm. and or they have CRP or sunflowers. I mean, they good out there. The Eastern Colorado grows big bucks, but I was able to stock in and kill that one. And it, it was <laughs> something special about that stocking white tail. Stocking white tail. Yeah, I got to do that last year in South Texas. Did you? Oh yeah, yeah. You killed a buck. Uh, rattling them or rattling. One yeah, in. rattling yeah. one in. I was like hiding in a cactus brush in this cactus brush. Yeah, with a decoy on the front. With those one of those ultimate predator decoys. Mm -hmm. Um, and he told me, Danny, you know, Danny Ferris. Ferris, yeah. Yeah, Danny was like, hey, when that buck stops, if it's not in range, flick the ear. They'll oh, come yeah. right in. Okay. And I was like, he stopped at like 45 yards. 
And I couldn't like move my rangefinder, but I like put my f- finger up and flicked it. And he was like, boing, boing, came that right to me, it. man. I couldn't believe it. And you so he stopped him. at like 30, like right at 30. And I guessed 30. Mm-hmm. And I guessed right because I smoked him, put one right in his chest. And he didn't make it far. Wow. And he laid down. He got up again and walked a little bit, but then he laid back down and yeah. it was over for him. But I was like, I, I just stalked a whitetail. Are you kidding me? That's awesome. I just shot one That's from the ground and I wasn't in a blind just sitting here. It's hard to do, man. It oh, is. They're so especially at your size. Oh, dude, I just—that's the problem. I don't hide very well. <laughs> hard to hide me. Yeah, that's I why know. I like hunting elk too. You stand in front of the tree; they don't care. That's yeah. what you're supposed to do: stand in front of the tree, you know. But it's like, yeah. Well, a lot of people get behind something, then they don't, then they can't get the shot because they got the yep. the tree in front of them or whatever. But yeah, you let that camo do its work, and you get a good backdrop. Then you got your your field of view wide open and you can shoot either way. That's the way to do it. But yeah, elk are not quite as sketched out as whitetail, you know, because they're so much bigger. They make noise. Um, they're clumsy too. in the, in the they, trees, man. Yeah. They, yeah. They, they just make, I mean, those antlers are going to be hitting <clears> on <throat> shit, you know, it makes some noise. So you can get away with a little bit more <laughs> but, huge bulls. <laughs> yeah. It's uh there's nothing like big bulls. I can't wait to hear how your season goes this year um so your bow is set up really good how where'd you get your bow set up and so dialed in um so hoyt is like uh, they're sponsoring my show too the wolf untamed the channel. youtube so yeah they sent it to me and then i take it to no limits okay <clears throat> so i took it to no limits um and they got great technicians in there man they're mm-hmm. all good um mm-hmm. so they hooked it up and you know, it was shooting good. Yeah. You know, shooting great today. He didn't have to do a lot of tuning on it. No, no. He just checked uh, cam timing a little bit, which sometimes those, the string stretches a little bit and different things change. One cam gets a little bit ahead. So he had one that was a little bit ahead of the other, but not much. I mean, I think Wayne said the second axis was right on. Third axis was pretty close. He tweaked a little bit, but then we went out at distance and you just put it to work. But yeah, I was impressed with how, how well No Limits had it set up. Yeah, they do. You. They do a good job, yeah. man. And they're always like on point. You know, I send guys to people that want to get into bow hunting. Mm-hmm. I always, I just send them there. Like, go there. They'll hook it up, man. They'll get you shooting. That's a, you know, that's a big advantage of having a good pro shop for a guy. Because there's people who buy the best equipment, but it's not set up right. Mm-hmm. They can have the same bow as you have, same everything as you have. You shoot it lights out. They can't hit anything cons- consistently because the bow's not, it's not set up right. Right. It's not tuned. It's not you know. And I don't like to have to tune my bow a lot. Yeah. Like, I, I want to know that when I grab that thing, mm-hmm. it's going to be ready to go. Yeah. I don't care if I d- ding it off of things and what, you know, because I carry it on my neck when I walk through the woods. Yeah. Me so too. I'm walking through the, those, you know, those branches and just after you've been hiking for 10 miles, you don't want to duck <laughs> under a branch. I'm no. walking right through it. <laughs> <laughs> don't let me forget to give you one of those AE prophecy rests. Yeah. That's the one I thing I do to need that. a new rest. I didn't yeah. like that rest ripped up some. <laughs> Ripped up some of my arrows. It was a little rough today. The crazy thing is, is that I hit that balloon with an arrow that had two fletches on it. <laughs> you did, yeah. <laughs> you had to overcome. Yeah, hey, but you're used to overcoming challenges, right? Yeah, just send it. So that was just another one. <laughs> yep. Yeah, your whole life's been overcoming. Today, you just overcame more and hit a balloon <laughs> with two fletches at 130 yards. But today was a grind, man. We had to, there was a lot of mental challenges, man. Push, carrying a rock. You know, mile what was that mile and a half? Mile and a half, yeah. Carrying it up a hill a mile and a half. I don't care who you are. That sucks. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's why I say it's like people overthink this stuff. And I mean, you you have some great workouts. You know, you you went through some some of them today, like the amazing hill workouts. But like, if I just want to get down to basics, I'm like, I'm just gonna carry this fucking rock up the hill. Because you know why? Because it's hard. <laughs> and it's, it's hard. Like your shit. core is gonna get fucking yeah, wrecked. Right. My core was hit. I was like, damn. I feel. <laughs> I feel. Well, I feel this in my core. And then you're switching the rock back and forth. So you're like, yeah. I know. It's like it engages everything. Mm-hmm. But it's like, <clears throat> to me, to be good in the mounds, you know, all those little adjustments and tweaks and moving and your ankles, you know, on the trail just being strengthened by being uneven and carrying things like that. There's no better preparation for hunting. Dude, carry that 76 pound rock. Yeah. I don't care if it's a 30 pound rock, carry something. (laughs) I see. I tell people that all the time. The only way to get into shape to go, like I said it earlier, Mm -hmm. the only way to get in football shape, play football. Yeah. The only way to get in a fight shape is to fight. 
The yeah. only way to get into hunting shape is to hunt. Yeah. And how do you practice hunting? You hike. Yeah. You want to practice elk hunting? Throw a pack on, put 45, put a 45 pound plate in the pack yeah. and then just go out and hike. That's right. And that'll get you ready. Yeah. Because guys come out west from the East Coast and they get their ass kicked. It's rough. It's <laughs> they rough. They get their ass kicked. And what happens is, uh, you know, everybody starts off pretty good right out of the gate. Like you, everybody's energized, fired up. But it's once the grind starts. Day and two, then, day three, day four. And then so mentally you're a little fatigued. Physically you're getting fatigued. So what I notice is people's feet get a little, they're not coming up high, high enough so they're hitting making noise because they're scraping on stuff they're kicking stuff they're kicking rocks or breaking branches they're being a little more lazy with their body movement then they see an animal and the wind is going a certain way and they're like well maybe i don't really need to go all the way to the top of the hill maybe i can just side hill it and still keep the wind and no and it's just like all these little you're taking shortcuts and all this or getting a little lazy or getting a little more fatigued all that adds up and you're not killing shit you're not killing anything (laughs) you're not you know so you need to be at your at the the same level you were on day one, I always say by day 10, if I do it right, I'm getting, I'm better than I was on day one because I'm more dialed in. I'm more like in mountain shape and I'm more, you know, your first day from civilization, you used to being distracted, used to different noises, used different things. But that day 10, you were focused on, okay, this is, I'm in tune with the mountains. I know where these animals are so I can be make more decisions on where they're going because I've I've been here for 10 days I know their habits and I'm I'm a little I'm in mount I'm mountain tougher you know what I mean so you should be better on day 10 instead of worse and a lot of guys they get worse because they don't they don't take care of themselves after day two they're worse when they when they get back to camp what do they do I don't know drink beer yeah instead of instead of drinking water Mm -hmm. and putting some protein in you and going to sleep they want to stay up and drink a beer, have some whiskey. Mm-hmm. So now that next day they're dehydrated. Right. So now they set themselves back. So I always take this approach, right? What you just said is just like an NFL training camp. Mm. By day 10, you see guys just fall apart mm-hmm. because it sucks. You're sleeping in some shitty hotel. You know, the bed's not right. This and that. There's all these excuses. And then you're putting on the same equipment every day. You're going against the same guy every day. By day 10, you should have him figured out. Right. And you should be in better shape. So what's your excuse? It's because yeah. you're not taking care of yourself. You're not getting in the cold tub after practice. Mm-hmm. You're not, we had a cryo chamber. You're not using the cryo. That cryo chamber is like the yeah. unbelievable. Love it. Right. Like, but it's, you know, it's not accessible to everybody. So yeah. to me, it's like, it's the same thing in the, in the woods, man. By the, by the halfway through, halfway point, you should be in... You should have the elk figured out. Mm-hmm. You should have the terrain figured out. Your feet should be acclimated. Your breathing should be acclimated. I mean, you, you should know how much water you need when you go out there. Cause you're going to f- screw that up the first couple of days. You're going to yeah. be like, Oh, f- I didn't bring enough water. Yeah. You know, but keep that pump on you so you can pump water, you know? And then w- what's pretty crazy is so the people who do it right. Cause you talk about what most people do is most people, you know, run themselves to the ground, come back. They don't rehydrate, refuel. They instead drink alcohol or they fuck around, stay up late, um, bitch about the hunting or bitch about the moon or about the weather or whatever. The, wind. the guys who stay focused and end up killing towards the lat- latter end of that hunt because they've been serious about it the whole time. Those are the guys who, the, the people who failed will be like, oh, must be nice. Must be nice to be Derek and be able to go to fucking New Mexico and kill big bulls. It's just like, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I like 60 miles yeah. in five days. Uh, right. Yeah. To do that. Like, I didn't, it wasn't easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But there was a target rich environment, but you still got to get to the, get the opportunity on the right bull. People can write it off. People can write anything. You know, you earn it. They can write it off as must be nice or it's like, yeah, I'd like to see him do that where I hunt. Yeah. Must be nice. I fucking hate that. When people say must be nice to me, I'm like, fuck you. Yeah. You know? I must know. be nice to sit around and just make excuses your whole life yeah, and never no. accomplish anything and be a hater. Cause yeah. you know what? I never met a, I'd said this to you earlier. I said, mm-hmm. I never met a hater that was doing better than I was. No, that's if that. somebody's hating on you. Look where they're at. Yeah. You know it, why? Cause it, Ray Lewis said this mm-hmm. and this was like the, you know, I heard this in a, in a speech he was given. He's like, you think that Eagles, like when an Eagle sees another bird at the same altitude as him, he thinks it's an Eagle. Yeah. Because no other bird flies that high. Right. So fly with the eagles. Yeah. Don't fly down there with the fucking crows. 
chirping all the time. <laughs> caw, caw, caw. You know, yeah. hit, you know, oh, I wish I was an eagle. Why do the eagles get to eat the deer first, you know? Right. Because they're the eagle. <laughs> be the alpha. Be the eagle. Be eagle Don't be yeah. the whiny little bitch yeah. that cries and whines because you don't have. And you don't have because you didn't work. You know, you know, for all the great things about hunting in the hunting community, there's a lot of people who talk shit in oh they talk so much shit it blows my mind yeah it does which blows my mind for this reason there's an attack on this entire culture Mm -hmm. like if it was up to the the other side this would be gone right we wouldn't be able to hunt yeah can we afford to be talking shit to each other no bringing each other we gotta come together man (laughs) i know i don't care what you hunt with yeah i don't care if you hunt with a bow a gun or whatever you want crossbow crossbow fucking spear well i don't give a shit trad Mm. bow whatever yeah we're on the same we are on the same team we're hunters i know and that's why it's uh it's but i think a lot of it is you know a lot of egos involved um it is and and it's just that's part of you know with with hunters you're going to get more alpha male type people and alpha male Male type people are very competitive. So there's ego. I get it. It's just the way it goes sometimes. But we have to be able to still look at the big picture and say, yeah, this fucking guy did kill another big bull. It kind of it kind of hurts my pride a little bit, but we're all hunters. You know? It's good, I look at it as good, good for it, him. dude. When somebody kills a big like if I see you kill a bull, mm-hmm. I'm just as jacked up as if I killed that bull. Yeah, I, that's how it should be. Now I am now, but I remember back in the day, and I wasn't always like as mature as I am. <laughs> and I remember there was this guy in town here. His name is Jim Carter, and he, I hadn't killed that bull yet. So I'd been hunting every year, and I've been I've been killing bulls, but I had never killed a six by six. And this guy was killing six by six big bulls every fucking year, and I'm just like driving myself crazy, going, "How can he do this?" How can he do that? I can't kill one. How can he do it every year? And so I did have my, my ego was bruised a little bit. Cause I'm just like, is this, do I suck? Is this guy, this just that much better than me? So yeah, it's a little bit of an evolution to, to get to where you're like, yeah, but even now you weren't, you weren't saying, you know, F that guy. I probably was. Oh yeah. I mean, when you're young, you know, you say shit young. like that. I but was young, but yeah, I get it. But I mean, now we just have to, you know, cause there's a lot of, I get if kids, act like that but hey there's a lot of grown men who are like grown ass men yeah like, come on guys matt listen there's i killed a i killed a deer one time down there in swash a big fork buck and my a guy that is my friend mm-hmm. he had been hunting that deer hard and it was a management deer they had to get him at like he was this nine-year-old old fork buck, buck yeah. old buck i could barely get my hands around his bases he was That's so like, big i love deer like that. i love that right yeah. that was like you know clay, said, clay was like we got this giant fork buck and i was like hell yeah that sounds like my kind of buck let's mm-hmm. go so i came down there and day one i just like got lucky and sent it at 80 yards and smoked, smoked him <laughs> and my buddy mark was oh, like, oh did you send me that video is that the one yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so my buddy mike was like he came out and looked at it and i could see it on his face he was pissed mm-hmm. And I get it because that's a deer he'd been hunting. You yeah. know what I mean? And he was like, you. Well, especially because Clay sent him a message like, all it took was me to come out here, bud. You couldn't get it done. Because <laughs> yeah. he's a guide, so you know. And, on, yeah. and he knows me. He kills a lot of big bulls and deer in uh, Utah. So yeah. to him, he was like, oh, fuck you guys, you know. But right. like, you see grown men really get yeah. mad yeah. over a deer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm like, dude, you should be happy for me, you know. Should, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I mean when there's a lot of passion involved a lot of emotion a lot of hard work i get part of it but i still i don't get like the shit that the hate that lasts you know what i mean yeah i mean come on but (laughs) yeah don't let it linger i know um so so in colorado there who's been like who do you shoot with and hang out with and learn from up there who's been those people a couple guys man you know luke hadio yeah, there's only a couple people that I've ever put my Super Bowl ring on, mm. and Luke's one of them. Yeah, he was actually the first one really? I ever let do it. There's one other guy we won't talk about him, but <laughs> I let him put it on. Um, but but Luke, 
you know, he reached out. He saw that I was at, he saw that I was at no limits getting a new bow set up. Okay. He had no idea that I'd been shooting as long as I have. Mm. So he's like, bring some of that NFL money up. Let's shoot. <laughs> oh, I said, all right, bud, I'll be there. Yeah. You wanted to so challenge I went up there and he was like, how long you been shooting? I was like, oh, I've shot my first deer when I was like 13. He goes, wait a minute. You've been shooting that long. And I was like, yeah, dude. And he was like, oh, fuck. I thought you just started. <laughs> he was trying to take, he hustle, was trying yeah. to hustle me. Yeah. Uh, but we did his podcast and shot for, you know, we shot, I took some of his money. He took my money, took it back though. He got it back because he? he was making, he was doing stuff on his, it was home field advantage. Yeah. He's a good guy that he's, he he's was the, hilarious. He was so much fun, man. And he, he linked me with a guy named Alec Nest, Alex Nestor. Yeah. And nestor has been like a great, um, you know, great at like kind of guiding me through like the, the who's who, who's right. a good guy. Who's full of shit, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I, um, Luke introduced me to Snyder. Aaron mm -hmm. Snyder with Kafaro and those guys. And those guys are awesome. Yeah. You know, so it, it's, but Luke, it all started with Luke, man. Cause like he got to know me and realized I wasn't a piece of shit, you know, just some arrogant yeah. football player. And I was really into this and, um, yeah, that's kind of where it all started. And he's like, man, you can really do something with this hunting stuff. Like, I think you're, you know, you're really into it. So you should just chase it. Yeah. So I did, man. Um, and so those are the guys, you know, Josh Walker, another guy, mm -hmm. um, in Colorado, um, trying to think of who else i well, those are chris dorsey you know chris dorsey yeah. is right chris dorsey is another guy that you know i'll reach out to and ask him for contacts and this and that and he's a good guy so there's a bunch of guys in colorado that are just good people that well, will link you all those guys you just mentioned yeah they know they know the game for sure yeah i mean yeah i love i love luke's personality and his he just seems fun you know i've <laughs> Have a, haven't hung out with him too much, but I've listened to his podcast. I know him. He sends sends me stuff. I try to give him shout outs when I can, and I just like what he does. I in, I mean, I like his, his podcast is great too. He's got like a great his, group of guys on he there. He does, yeah, yeah. Gladiators Unchained, Unleashed, Unleashed, Gladiators Unleashed. Yeah, I always, always screw that up. Yeah, he's had and Nestor's good on there too because <laughs> Nestor's just got crazy stories. He's got crazy most stories. Most of them are probably full of shit. Or he what? is full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> just dude kidding. that lion hunt he took me on that's <laughs> that mother hmm. yeah dude he caught he was obviously he's like a mountain goat up there right? right i'm crawling through the snow and he's calling me where are you at yeah. we're gonna lose this cat right and i'm like i'm like fuck you i'm coming you know and he <sighs> sent me a pin mm -hmm. he's like when you get to the top back to the top come straight to the pin so i did yeah it was the road <laughs> you dropped me a pin on the road and he's like oh no you got to come back up. Oh no. You're yeah. never getting up here is what he said. Oh God. He must not know me. Yeah. But I was full body cramping. Now my ribs were cramping my hammies, my quads, my calves, my forearms were locking up, but I just crawled. What were the forearms locking up for? Just for, from, hanging on to stuff. No, yeah. Yeah. I'm like hanging on for dear life. Right. And I have my bow in my hand. So I'm like, you know, crawling you like this all oh, the whole time, <laughs> the whole time cussing. And uh, finally, I get up there, and I'm, like, laying under the cat and looking up at him. He's, like, <sighs> doing that. And I was, like, oh, shit, that's real now. Let's go. It's a big lion, yeah. Huge lion. I didn't realize how big he really was until yeah. I went and tried to pick him up. And like I said, I was hurting. And yeah. I was, like, oh. So I guess, he, I guess Alex wasn't really full of shit. He just, like, made it harder than he needed. He's just an asshole. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I guess yeah, not full of shit, Alex. Just an asshole. No, he's been supportive of. I mean, he, so supportive, he started man. off. Yeah, he started off as a hater of me, which he'll admit. But now he, I think he's we're we're cool now. Well, that's what he told me. He's like, you're gonna love Cam. He's like, you're gonna love him. <laughs> I don't know about that, but no, I I do I do like Alex. Uh, Aaron, Aaron's been great. Luke, um, yeah, Aaron's been. I'm actually proud of. Aaron's journey because he grew up here in Oregon also some little shit town small town guy like me and uh, I don't want to say his town is a shit shit town I meant a small town guy like me and uh <laughs> you know kind of overcame all the odds to now he's basically running Kafaru it's pretty impressive yeah I'm very happy for it's him. a great company too man yeah they make great products they make great stuff yeah yeah but yeah man I just I've been blessed to just kind of be introduced to the right people and then because you killed that giant lion and it got got you on Fox News, right? Yeah. Tucker Carlson. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then that somehow led to Rogan. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. It led to Rogan, which before Rogan, so before before I killed that lion, I was doing a duck hunt down in um Stuttgart. And I'm not even really into duck hunting. I was yeah. like, 
yeah, sure. I'll come down. You know, my buddy, Russ Rowan, he, uh, he's the marketing guy. He runs the show at King's camo. Now, mm. um, it's, it's, uh, you know how these big companies are kind of buying up all the little outdoor companies yeah. under one on umbrella. He kind of runs a bunch of different companies. Okay. But he was like, let's go down to Stuttgart and duck hunt. I was like, okay, cool. Well, kid rock was down there. Mm. So he and I like hit it off. You know, nice. just having a good time together, you know, you know, shooting at ducks and not really hitting anything, just, you know, <laughs> yeah, having a good time, drinking some beers and, you know, yeah. just getting to know each other and stuff. And uh, he was like, hey, come, you need to come to the big, to the White House, to Dixie Ridge. That's what he calls his like compound, house, yeah. you know? So we go down there, man, and just like had a blast. And, you know, that led to me playing a foursome in golf with Donald Trump and John Daly and Kid Rock. So like, that's incredible. So now it's like, it's just crazy what has happened you know just from and that's why i told alex i was like he, he really wanted to come meet joe mm -hmm. because he was telling me a story about how you and rihanna left him <laughs> we left him yeah you guys didn't call him or something he, but he's full of shit so who knows if that's real <laughs> i don't know i don't know what, and he's what, like can i want to meet joe so bad can you take me and i was i yeah. asked joe if it was all right if he came he's like yeah he just can't come into the when we're recording right, i was like yeah. he doesn't he doesn't want to do that he just wants to come down yeah so we, I took him down there with me for that. And we went That's to the awesome. comedy, sh we went to the comedy show and, yeah. um, and you want to talk about just a solid dude, man. Joe Rogan was, I had a blast just having a con. We went, we went for three and a half hours and he had to stop me. Cause I was just having a fun time chatting about just random shit. You know, yeah. we're talking about mushrooms. We're talking about all this other stuff. You know, it was just like my, my goal in life has been to do something for Joe because he does something for everyone else. Yeah. Pays for everything, does things, hooks people up, gives them, you know, access to his platform, which is the biggest in the world. The biggest it's, it's in the world. Like, it's just like, what? So, yeah, there's like been two things I've been able to do for him as long as I've known him. And it's just like, okay, I finally. Finally. Fit, I, what was it? What, was you, what were you able to do? Uh, Had to be hunting related. No, no. It uh, wasn't? Well, I mean, hunting is just, that's for me. That's not for him. Right. I, I just love to take people hunting. But no, he uh, he said something like his wife can, was in Vegas gonna, and him and or her and the daughters were going to go see Luke Bryan. And I said, oh, they got good tickets? So you got a hookup? He's like, no, I think just got regular tickets. So I was like, oh, fuck. Maybe I can get him good tickets to Luke Bryan and... Maybe this would be one thing I could do for him. So, you know, made a connection with my buddy Hunter, who works for Luke, got it, and they were able to meet Luke and get sweet seats. So that's I'm what it's like, all about. I'm like, fuck, I fucking finally did something <laughs> for Joe. And then I think the other thing is just I, I got some shoot my new shoes and then a bow for him. So that'll nice. be that'll be the second thing I've ever done for him. But anyway, point is, is he is such a good guy that he does so much for everybody else. It's just like you know, you say what a salt of the earth type person he is. And it's just like, man, you just want to, you want to be around people like that. And then also you want to try to like, it's been my mission to try to do something for him yeah. just because he's been so amazing to so many others. But yeah, I don't know. He does it without expecting anything in return. No. You know, it's like, that's to me, that's a gift. Isn't a gift. If you expect something in return, like yeah. you're doing it for alter alternative reasons, right? Yeah. Like you're, yeah. You're expecting me to do something for you now. Right. No, I mean, he never does. Ne never, never expects anything. He's just like, I, I just, I've really tried to emulate how he treats people. I've tried to learn from him yeah. because it's just like, I've seen it so many times. I'm like, that's how people need to be. <laughs> and so, you know, there's those people that you're around and they make everyone better. That's, that's, what I've learned from him, but uh, yeah, uh, Alex. I don't remember not calling Alex. So I'm not sure what I'm not sure what's that about. He's full of shit. <laughs> I don't know. He just tells good stories. He does tell awesome stories. Yeah, on on the on Luke's podcast, it's pretty fun to it's listen to. Hilarious the shit he. I mean, and who knows how much of it's real, but whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot uh, of it is real. About ninety percent. I think it is. Yeah, about ninety percent. He's real. just done a lot, but oh, I did want to hear. So about. Did uh, did you see Trump grab anybody in the pussy when you were with him? No, he no, didn't, no, nothing, dude. This guy was well, so the, respectful. The news says that's what he does all the time. Yeah, well, they're the media. Yeah, because they they're woke <laughs> as fuck and they hate they hate Donald Trump. Yeah, I but know. Hunter Biden and Joe Biden and they can just like pay everybody from foreign I policy, get, no. for, get money for foreign policy from foreign countries, and that's okay. 
But you know, Donald, Donald Trump is recorded saying some bullshit back in the day. They're talking shit like just locker like we're room doing talk. here. It's just locker room talk, yeah. man. Like people talk shit all the time. All like, this every day. But dude, I'm telling you, like there was we were in Nashville at the Troubadour plan. And there was a there was every every little house we went to had like a party going on with a Trump sign out there. He stopped at every single one of them and took pictures of the people and was night like let them jump in the cart and can take a, come take a picture and um and there was a lot of uh, pretty there's a lot of beautiful women around. Mm-hmm. He was so respectful to everybody, treated everybody the same. Mm. I never got that creepy old man. You know, old men can be creepy around. Yeah. Pretty they just. They don't give a shit anymore. They say what they want. You <laughs> yeah, know? right. He was never gave me that vibe at all. No. Because I was like curious, you know, yeah. like I was just like, is well, this you've a- heard everybody's heard it. That's for- all they say. Yeah. But that's just, that, that goes to show you, you never really know somebody until you spend time mm-hmm. with them and get to know them. Yeah. And I spent eight hours with the guy, had two meals with him and a lot of conversation. And he was just like so genuine and so cool. And it wasn't like he was trying to be that way. You could tell it was just like, that's how he is. And he's just got this personality that's just kind of. I mean, it's when he walks in the room, it's like he might as well be the only person there because everybody's like focused, like, oh, yeah. shit. Tr-. He's got like that thing about him. He does, man. Yeah. And he knows it. But he, you know, it's cool to hear how how good he was to be around. And it's just like you hear so much of the, the negative bullshit that, you know, it's nice to hear the truth from people who have actually spent time. It's with all him. garbage propaganda, man. Mm-hmm. It's not real. Yeah. It's not real. You don't really know anybody until you spend time with them. No. And I mean, the country, you know, it was, I remember seeing firsthand the type of excitement there was for, it was his reelection. And, uh, you know, we went around and did a few stops to, to help in his campaign. And at the same time, so I was with Trump Jr. and Ted Nugent and, and me, and we did these, these stops and we're speaking in the same towns that Biden and Obama were in. And we would go and the security would say, oh yeah, we just did Biden and Obama's thing down the road. You know, I go, oh yeah, how many people were there? They said a hundred. And there's thousands to see Trump Jr. Not me, but I was one, one of the people, but Trump Jr. and Ted Nugent, thousands in the same town. And I'm like, how can this election have went this way when nobody gives a fuck dude. even obama's there and there's only 100 people how is this happening dude something's fishy yeah that's yeah. all i'm gonna say i don't something know something is fucking fishy it, and i don't like it and it, it seems weird it seems really weird because all you see is him with nobody yeah showing up and then you're gonna tell me he got more votes than obama yeah i remember in 2008 when he got elected right i was in cincinnati i was a freshman okay the city erupted they were so fired up right the whole city was voting everybody Mm-hmm. you're I telling me he that. got more votes than him when nobody gave a fuck on out on the campaign trail nobody's there nobody's showing up to show support so I, where is this you know because that's what it's all about is like you get on the campaign campaign trail you see what type of energy there is mm-hmm. you know what, what the voter base is saying if the voter base isn't even showing up for an in-person thing, especially when he's locked in a basement all the time, there's there's no excitement, there's no there's no energy. So mm. how are you saying that 81 million people all of a sudden showed up to vote? They just expect you to be a, a good sheep and ba oh, man, be a good sheep and ba. Pretty frustrating. The sheeple. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty frustrating, but yeah, I mean, it's it that sounds like an amazing foursome: John Daly, Kid Rock, and uh, Trump. Yeah. And you and me. It wow. was fun. It was so much fun, man. He was like shocked that I was good at golf. You know, mm-hmm. he was like, you're so big. How are you so good? Yeah. You know, and I was like, I don't know. I'm just so who won John Daly. Of course. <laughs> That's right. John Daly. Yeah. yeah. Dude, he'll put it like three feet from the pin and be like, ah, I'm like, why second? didn't you like that? He was who? like, oh, I should have, that should have went in. I'm who like, got second? Oh, Trump. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He's didn't, consistent. did you beat Bobby? I don't think so. No, there's some holes. I just didn't even finish. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good for like a couple good shots here and there, man. I'm not it's like hard to stay focused for that. The long. consistency you have yeah, to have yeah. in your swing. And I was using clubs that weren't mine too, which oh, is okay. What my I swing with so much force. Yeah, like I'm not trying to swing hard. It's just like right. so much coming that like if I don't leverage. have a really stiff club shaft, the the driver shaft will like flex and then send the ball who knows where. Right, I hit it far, but it never goes straight. Well, I mean, you must have good hips from football, and isn't that like 
you know, yeah, it's that all, torque on yeah, that. It's torque and pushing, keeping like your f- weight on your back leg and mm-hmm. following through. I just like, he was like, your swing speed is really good. It was cool because like, one of the first holes, I chipped one in from like way out. Yeah. You had no quit business. right there. You should quit. I know. He was standing right there watching it. And he was like, <laughs> Who, and, Trump? Yeah. And he was like, Wow, I can't believe you made that. Like, yeah. he's like, and then he started wanting to bet. He wanted to start making bets. Oh, he wanted that NFL money. Yeah, well, he well no, he wanted to bet against John Daly. Oh, okay. he's like, I think we could beat him. And I was like, oh, all right, fine, I guess yeah. we can. We could beat him. Gotcha. But he was. It was fun. It was a fun competition, man. It oh, was, that sounds great. We weren't taking it that serious. Like, I don't even really know who actually won, but I know John Daly definitely beat us off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, odds are he should win. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I, I mean, Trump plays a lot. If you listen to the mainstream media, they say he plays every single day, even when he's president. But, yeah, yeah I don't know. I mean, he's... Uh, 18, 18 holes, 18 fairways. Really? Never saw him lose a ball, never saw him, like... As and in between this, while he's, like, going to his ball, he's, like, stopping and, like, talking to the people, you know, like, talking yeah. to all these people. That's pretty cool. So cool, man. The support that he gets. I, don't know, I have a hard time believing he's not going to win again. I. They have to cheat. They're going to cheat again, and that's like, uh, you know, my wife is a is like really into this, like paying attention to what's going on, and she just she fills me in on stuff, and she's like terrified. It gets frustrating because you you feel like you're helpless. Like, what can you do? What can you do? You tell me that it's a democracy, and all I can do is vote, and then I do vote. And you're telling me my vote doesn't matter because yeah. you're just going to cheat. You're just going to pick who you want anyway. I mean, it's... And then then when you live in a place where, like, the city decides everything for everyone else, yeah. like, that, that's not fair. No, that's like here. I mean, you know how they have the electoral college for the country? I always think that the states need to have that same setup. So, our, like, here, Portland pretty much decides everything. You know? Yeah, it's the same in Denver. Denver and right. Boulder decide everything. So, the whole rest of the state is red. Portland and probably Eugene here are blue and that's it. I mean, the whole rest of the state doesn't matter what you think. No. So uh, I still think it needs to be some type of weighted system like the, just like the country runs, but for the state, each County, right? Each County should have a a lot, like a certain amount. Yeah. And it's just like, cause it's not, I don't know. I mean, it it feels something feels off. That's all I know. It's not fair. Yeah. That's not fair. You know, it's like, it's like when Hillary Clinton lost because mm-hmm. she thought she was going to, she thought that they were going to be able to cheat. Yeah. And she thought the fake dossier was going to work and she right. thought all that stuff was going to work. But turns out you're just evil. Oh, thank and God people, she didn't win. Oh, yeah. that was scary, man. I know. I know it. She's like, she doesn't care about human life at all. No, no. It like, does not care. That the only thing that did wake them up to be like, okay, now we got to, we can make sure that, a fuck because they fucked up to let Trump win basically. Yeah. You know, thought they're going to control everything. They'd get who they wanted and it didn't work. Now it's made it really tough, <laughs> you know, to make it fair. All we want is a fair election. That's it. Just make yeah. it fair. If Can you win fair and square, fine. But uh, I don't think you did. Yeah. I don't believe that. I want to see the proof. It's hard to believe, but well, especially because in the middle of the night, you just have all these votes show up like from where? Yeah. And then yeah. people are saying that their cat had a ballot and they're, dog had a ballot or dead cat had a ballot it's like i don't know yeah some of it i'm like <laughs> is this you know is there a conspiracy theory in there or is part of it legit i think it's like some of both well i think what they're doing i think their plan now is to they're gonna try to like make it a, so that if you don't aren't if you aren't an actual citizen here like these uh illegals that are coming across mm-hmm. fine but why do they get to vote right you're gonna let them vote who yeah. you think they're gonna vote for? They're gonna I vote know. for whoever you tell them to vote for. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so thanks for letting me in. Out. Yeah. Right. So they don't get kicked out. They're gonna do whatever that you tell them, so they don't get kicked out. That's probably the game. So That's... you have a million people coming over. Yeah. You have over like at one time. Yeah. They so, say six million have come over so far this year, dude. You know, I mean, something crazy like that. But it's scary. It is. It's really scary, man. I don't know. I don't. I really I don't, don't like want to give up hope, but sometimes it's it's hard not to. You know, well, what can we do? Yeah. What can we do? Are we going to revolt? Going to start a revolution? Carry the rock up the hill. Yeah. I'm just going to continue carrying rocks <laughs> that, and doing hard shit. That's <laughs> all I could do. Um, I, was, I was curious. We'll switch gears real quick. Who is the best uh, in the NFL? I'm always, I'm always attracted to like the best leaders, people like men who can lead other men. Yeah. Who's been the best leader that you've ever been around? Peyton Manning. 
Okay. Yeah, Peyton Manning and Demarcus Ware, two two guys that I can. Even you know, Demarcus is just so, like he he's he's earned it mm-hmm. with his play, and then the way he carries himself and day to day, and the same with Peyton. You know, everything he does is like on a professional level. Like he shows up to work looking professional. Mm-hmm. You know, he shows up to meetings looking professional, but he's also got a really good sense of humor that he can relate to you. So he doesn't, you don't feel like you're with this crazy superstar when you're having a conversation right. with him. But then you're like, wait a minute, that's Peyton Manning. Holy, sh-, you know, <laughs> yeah. we were at a funeral and people were, we were paying respects to the, to our fallen teammate. Mm-hmm. And just, we turned the corner. Somebody's like, Hey, can I get an autograph? Oh man. Yeah. Like he's got that star he's got factor, that star sure. factor mm-hmm. to where like you're at a funeral and you're going to ask him because yeah. you might never see him again. Did he ever, so was it just his demeanor that would impact you or did he ever talk to the defense? He would just talk to you as a person mm. at breakfast. Mm-hmm. He'd come have breakfast with you. Like mm. I had breakfast with him like every day. Really? And we would just talk and mm. he would just like, it, you know, it was never, he was never like preaching to you. It was just like. Just made you want to be better. Made you want to be better. Like you didn't want to disappoint him, man. Mm-hmm. Cause like you see how hard he's working and you're like, man, I don't want to be the guy to let him down. Right. Like, and he wouldn't even really say anything if he did, but he would just be like, Hey, do you really need to do that? Like, yeah, you don't need to do that. Yeah. You know? So just like subtle things that he would do. The same with D Ware. Like he never made you feel like a piece of shit for screwing up. Mm-hmm. You just didn't want to disappoint him. You didn't want to let him down. You wanted him to say good job. Right. Like I wanted Peyton to come up and say good job, dude. Good job, man. Good, mm-hmm. you know, good play. Because it means something coming from a guy like that. Yeah. And that's what made him a great leader. He wasn't like a rah rah scream at you guy, but he'll give a great speech and make it funny, and you know, you know, say you know funny stuff. He was you know one time he was. It was my rookie year. You know, I was single and everything. And he goes, he's talking to the team and he's talking to, you know, you guys want to go out on Friday nights and stuff and, and chase girls, this and that. And he's like, well, let me tell you something. The more plays you make, the more girls you get. That's what he said to us. And yeah. he was like, that's, he's right. He yeah. didn't say girls. He said another word, but <laughs> we won't say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's just, uh, that's a relatable thing to say though. You know, you yeah. don't expect, you're expecting some like serious speech. You know, I'm a rookie. I'm expecting like, this is the first speech he gave me. And he said that his brother told him that, mm. you know, cause it's like, don't, don't focus and don't sacrifice what you want the most for what you want right now. Right. You know, yeah. there's an end goal. Mm-hmm. So don't sacrifice that for the short term gain. Like, let's ever, get in for the long haul. Do you ever remember him telling you good job on during a game? Yeah. 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 It was like, like a kid, you know, when your coach tells you good job. Yeah. You know, come up and smack him, but good play, great play, you know, and it's like, yeah. oh, Peyton just said great play. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but then like he's become a friend now. So like now if I need advice on something or I need to, I need to, I need to ask a question, like he did the, uh, the announcement for all the, um, for the schedule. Mm. And I was arguing with my co-host. I was like, I bet he got paid for that, you know? Yeah. And he was like, no, he didn't. I don't think he got paid for that. I'm like, come on, man. He got, it's Peyton Manning. He got paid for that. All right, so I was like, let me down, let me ask him. So I texted him. He's like, nope, I didn't. Really? You know, and I was like, dude, that just shows you, like, yeah, he did that for the Broncos, that you know, just as a solid. Mm-hmm. You know, because that's a big deal. You know, the the schedule release is like right. a huge thing. You know, okay, it's like a gender reveal. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> so they had him announce it. Huh? Yeah, they had him do like a whole skit with uh, some of the uh, one of the actors from the Office and stuff. It was cool. Oh, good. You know, yeah. but and Demarcus, man, like he gave a speech the night before the Super Bowl Fifty. Yeah, <sighs> dude. I don't even know what he said. Really? I was just like, whoa. He gets up there with a suitcase. And all I know is he pulled the he pulled the Lombardi out. Really? And just started talking. And I was like, I would have ran through a wall for that guy. It didn't matter. Yeah. You think that puts you on the right path to winning? Oh, yeah. That that speech. Yeah. Got everybody but, locked in. Well, we were pretty locked in already, mm-hmm. but that speech like set us over the top. We our confidence was so high. It didn't matter. Cam Newton came running by our sidelines in these gold shoes. And I was like, he doesn't even know what's he, in store. He doesn't even know. Mm-hmm. We took his soul. Yeah. <laughs> we took yeah. his soul that game. He quit. He gave yeah. up. He didn't even try to get a fumble. I know, man. I don't, I don't know if it doesn't seem like, was he ever the same after that? Never. Cause then he switched to vegan yeah. and then he's like, was, wasn't performing, getting hurt. And it's like, I don't know if he ever came back. Everybody that I've seen switched to that vegan diet ended up getting hurt. Yeah. They all got hurt. Something was going on with them. Seems like I, they'd get lean and look good, but they yeah. Can you perform? You can't perform like that. Your Especially muscles need meat. In a in a 
in a sport like the NFL. Yeah, fucking dude, meat grinder. Meat mass. Yeah. And like you can't be a, you are what you eat, man. Yeah. Your plants are frail. Right. So that, that year that you guys beat Cam, was he the MVP that year? Yep. Yeah. It was one of the best offenses ever. Superman, doing the Superman. I know. Doing the dab on everybody. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it seemed like they were they were on it. What was the score of that game? Do you remember? Did you guys beat them? We beat them. I mean, we, we beat them by like two or three touch. Two, like, I think we beat them by like 14, seven, 14 points or something like that or 10 points. I don't know. It was, it was what, a beat down. What does it feel like to be a Super Bowl champion? Oh, man, it's like, you know, I told you this earlier on the mountain. You know, when I was seven years old, I saw Reggie White carrying a trophy, the suit the Lombardi around, and I said, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. So everything I work, I've been working towards, it was to carry that trophy like that. And I got to do it. I got to take that trophy in front of a million people in Denver and in, in front of town hall and just hold the trophy in the parade. And like, yeah. And just like screaming and yelling like, ah, like that felt like the pinnacle. I bet the pinnacle, man. Yeah. And then it was like, <laughs> it was terrible for four years, man. We couldn't win. A, we, I mean, we were winning four games, five games. Like it was. What happened? Uh, we lost Peyton Manning. Yeah. And then a coaching carousel and then shit rolls downhill, just like in any business. Yeah. Once ownership is out, our owner got, our owner was out. He, he had passed mm. and it was like a scr- hard, a scramble for the family was fight in fighting and stuff, trying to take over the team. And are they going to sell it? They're not going to sell. And then like, the GM, you know, John Elway, just like, how's he going to keep up with all that stuff? How's he supposed to run an organization mm-hmm. whenever the top isn't even really there? Yeah. Um, you know, so it made it tough on him to do his job. And, uh, you know, eventually we just, you know, going through three different coaches and it was just too much, man. It was yeah. too much. And then now the, the Walmart group bought, they, they have $60 billion. $40 billion more than the next owner. Oh, my God. The next closest richest owner. Yeah. They should have money to put into it. And the they are then. dumping money in there. And I got to meet Greg Penner the other day, who's who's uh, um, Kerry Walton's husband. Mm-hmm. So he's, like, in charge of the team. Dude, awesome guy. Yeah. Like, I mean, this guy's a super billionaire, man. Like, not even, like, on the same planet as me. And he came up to me and had, like, an awesome conversation with me really? about his plans and what he's looking to do. Like, he's excited. That's sweet. Like he's not just a, it's not just a toy. Yeah. You know, Cause some of these guys buy a team and it's just a toy. Mm-hmm. It's just like buying a car or an, an, a house Yeah. or some random business they swallow up, you know? Right. But no, he bought this team to win hmm. and it's pretty impressive to see a group like that come in and I'm like, it's finally, they have an ownership group and that's what we were missing was ownership. What do you, what do you think about Russell Wilson, the, the QB? He had a tough year last year. He did have a tough year. But what happened with him was that he was he was put into a situation where they gave him all they let him just do what he wanted, mm-hmm. and that's not always a bad thing. Right? What do you Pay, mean, like like personnel decisions? Per, not even personnel decisions. Oh. Play calling. Mm. Um, he, Russell Wilson is the type of quarterback that has to move around. Mm-hmm. He's got to be out of the pocket. Yeah, you know he's not a stand in the pocket, read a defense, make yeah. a throw. He's a get out of the pocket, guys open. I'm going to make the throw. That's him. Yeah. He wanted to be pocket guy that wins, you know, plays for another 10 years, 15 years, yeah, whatever. Yeah, but he's not 6'6". Six, six. He can't see over <clears> the line. You can't see over the line. Yeah. Dude, he was struggling. Then you had, they said it was just like a free-for-all around there. He had his own office. He had a coach that he paid. He was putting in a game plan on Tuesdays, and then the coaches come in on Wednesday, put a game plan in, and it's completely different. God. So you want to talk about just like confusion? That's not going to work. It didn't work. So now yeah. Sean Payton's in there. Hmm. And you're going to see a big change. You're going to see, I think, Russell, I think they're going to win 12 games this year. That's what think I'm saying. Think so? Yeah, I think they'll win 12 games. So he'll come in, Sean, or Sean Payton will come and clean it up, get everybody back in the roles they're supposed to be in, yep. put people in position for success, mm-hmm. not have the quarterback making the game plan. Yeah. <laughs> With his coach that he pays? <laughs> That's That seems crazy. It wasn't working, and they kept doing it. No. I'm like, what are you guys doing, man? Like, this is bad. Yeah, that's the that's the rough part with being uh, what two hundred and forty million, I think, is what his contract. So when you come with that contract, <laughs> there's expectations. Yeah, you better win games. You can't win five games. So man. <laughs> he's getting just crucified in the media, dude. The laughing stock. Yeah, I don't know if you remember, but he did like a. They went to London, and he was talking about how yeah everybody was sleeping. I was doing high knees on the plane. Like yeah. what the fuck are you talking about, dude? 
Don't, Nobody cares. Don't be throwing your teammates under the bus, first of all. Well, yeah. No, like, we know you work hard, bro. Like, yeah. nobody questions your work ethic. Right. We're questioning your decision making. <laughs> yeah, you're high knees. And, like, now I'm even more questioning because why would you say that? Yeah, I know. That just seems weird. Yeah. Well, I that's know. the problem, man. That's why, like, when I talk about Peyton never feeling like he was out of touch, mm -hmm. he always felt like one of the guys. Yeah. And I think that that is really important for a quarterback. To relate because the quarterback is going to make more money than everybody, yeah. And in the NFL, there's a financial lane, you better stay in it, mm -hmm. right? Don't try to live like Russell Wilson, don't try to live like Von Miller, right? Like Von Miller's making you know 25 million a year, 22 million a year, 21 million. Like, you can't live like that, you yeah. don't get to live the way he lives, you live a different lifestyle, mm -hmm. all right? Don't like stay out of that financial lane, but whenever he comes in that locker room, he is the same as you, yeah, regardless of his bank account. That's how Peyton made you feel. Now, I don't think that Russell Wilson makes people feel that way. No, he seems... And he doesn't try to, but he's married to a superstar musician. Yeah. You know, they fly private all over the all over the world. They're going to Morocco, and they're going to this yeah. F1 race, and they're going here and there. That's so unrelatable to guys. But you know what is relatable? Peyton Manning pulling up in a fucking Buick, mm -hmm. getting out with a, a vest and a, long, and a button up on and carrying a briefcase. You, that's relatable doesn't it does it seem weird that you'd have to explain that to somebody like you know if, if you had a quarterback like wilson it's like you can't do you have to tell them don't act like a prima donna don't have your own set of rules these are men you need to be able to relate to them if you're going to lead them why would you have to explain that does that seem weird it's a great question I mean, if you're, you if, shouldn't have to, he should know that by now. I would think, but I mean, they said in Seattle that he out, out wore his welcome. Right. Like, and it's because he like, he wanted to get the head coach fired up there and he wanted this and he wanted that. And it's like, that dude, just, you were a third round pick mm -hmm. undersized guy who was able to get to two Super Bowls. You won one. You've never had an MVP vote. Mm -hmm. Who do you think you are? Yeah. No, bro. It's, I was around the MVP. Right. Peyton Manning. That didn't act like that. He didn't act like that. Yeah. And I kept saying that on the radio. I was like, man, I can't believe he's acting like this. Because I was at the combine with Russell Wilson. Mm. I played against him when he was at NC State. Okay. So I've known him. Yeah. He used to be way different. Now he's like. Like a normal guy? Yeah. He was yeah. like normal. Have a normal conversation. Now yeah. he's like, I'm talking to a robot. Right. Like, what is going on here? It's like he has to be told what to say at all times. Yeah. That seems weird. That's weird to me. Yeah, I but I think he's Sean Payton will bring him back down to earth. Think so? Yeah, and I could tell by being around. Mm. He's got him. Okay. Yeah. So you, you've you've seen a difference already, dude. The feel around that building is way different. Yeah. Because it was like a free for all last year. Mm -hmm. Training camp, they might as well have been glamping. Really, Just dude. It was. They weren't competing. They weren't working. They were getting hurt. Like goofing around. But with Sean Payton, you could tell that it's like. It seems military. like. You know, it's crazy when you take when one person, I mean, is I guess a coach can do it like Sean Payton, but also when you take like a Tom Brady that goes to Tampa Bay, they hadn't won anything. One guy can change that culture. What's the quarterback position, man? That is, isn't that crazy? It's the only, it's the only sport that's like that mm -hmm. where the quarterback position is so important in the NFL. If you don't have a good quarterback, you cannot win. Right. I don't care. We had, in 2016, coming back from that Super Bowl win, we had the number one defense again, and we didn't win. We won nine games. Who's your quarterback? Trevor Simeon. Hmm. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great guy. Yeah. But, like, he's just not that guy. Right. He's not the guy. Yeah. He's just a guy. So so that quarterback, like Tom Brady, coming in, he helped. The defense even feels better, right? Yeah. Every, mean, he makes everyone everybody. around him better. Yeah, that's the sign. Because of you it. don't want to waste the opportunity. Right. We got Tom fucking Brady. Yeah. You think that defense was like, dude, we got Tom Brady. We got to go now. You know, and I never heard what well, the crazy thing about it, maybe is because his play backed it up, but I never heard how much he was making at Tampa Bay. You know how like Russell went to Denver and all anybody talked about was 240 or 250 million. I never heard anything about Tom Brady. What, never. With the money. He always he took made. less money. He took less money. So and other guys could be on the team. Okay, that must have been it. Because if you pay your quarterback all this, you have no money for anything. There's a cap. Anybody. There's yeah. a cap. Mm -hmm. So if you spend a quarter of your cap on one guy, how are you going to pay anybody else? He's yeah. not going to be. His supporting cast is not going to be very good. 
Where if you if you were a, a GM or a coach, so you invest in the quarterback, then then where? What's the second most important? Pass rusher. Okay. So an outside pass rusher. Yeah, because that left tackle. Yeah. So quarterback, left tackle, pass rusher, then lockdown safety or lockdown corner. Corner. Okay. And then interior pass rush. Yeah, because if you can put pressure on their quarterback, and be able to lock a receiver up one on their their star receiver one on one with the lockdown corner, then it opens up all sorts of different things. It opens right? it up. Yeah. But if you got to double a guy and use safety help all the time. Mm-hmm. Then there's another guy that's exposed. Right. So it's like that, you know, that Super Bowl year, we had Chris Harris, all pro, Aqib Tlaib, all pro, mm-hmm. pro bowler, Hall of Famer. Um, TJ Ward, he's a duck. Yeah. Absolute dog. Darian yeah. Stewart back there. I mean, we, they were called the no fly zone, man, because nobody could get, we were on that court. Cause you got to think, you got DeMarcus Ware. Yeah. So the quarterback only has what, how, how long till you guys got to him? So you try to get there before three seconds. Okay. That's the, that's like the timing in their head is Mm -hmm. one, two, three, throw one, two, three, throw. So think about that. You got to get by this guy. You got to get off the ball, get by this guy and tackle him before he gets rid of the ball. Mm -hmm. So having a great secondary that makes him like second guess himself and hold it for just like a, uh, yeah, that creates that sack. That creates a sack Mm -hmm. because a guy like Tom Brady, that ball is like catch, throw, catch, Mm -hmm. throw, catch, throw. You're not getting there. And that's what Peyton, when he got to Denver, he was like that too. Yep, he wasn't throw. holding that ball very long. Hell no, because all you do is tap his shoulder, he'd fall. <laughs> yeah, no, he was. I mean it. For his, One time, this guy we were playing Pittsburgh. Braces. We were playing Pittsburgh in the playoffs, and this guy almost got him, and he just said, you know, he just slid, and they didn't blow the whistle, so he got up and threw a touchdown pass. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Everybody stopped. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, he's down. No, he uh, got up and threw a touchdown pass. Oh, man. And we won the game. It was insane. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's, it is. It's like a, it's a timing thing. Mm-hmm. And it is, you know, when it comes to the leadership of a quarterback, they are the, they command the offense. They, yeah. they run the show. And they can't be a, just a passenger out there, you know, like they have to run the show. It, so I see and, a lot of talented guys. Like, right. Like, I play with Lamar, too, Lamar Jackson. Mm-hmm. He is, like, the uh, team guy, all about the team, all about what's, like, what's good, what's the best for you, what do you want to do? Like, that's how he is, and that's mm-hmm. why he's so great, because he's got the talent to back it up, too. Right. He'll beat you with his legs. He can beat you with his arm. He can read a defense. He knows how to break down a defense. Yeah, he's just impressive to me. What What happens when the team doesn't believe in the quarterback? <laughs> <laughs> doubt yeah it's just like anything right what happens when you're out you know in the backwoods and that doubt starts creeping in right all right it crept in this week but now it, next week's a new week tomorrow's a new day mm-hmm. that doubt creeps in a little more yeah and then it starts to spread that's why it's like leadership if it's not there mm-hmm. the locker room lawyers will start talking and they'll start chat and chatter and then little clicks develop and next thing you know the team's separated and divided yeah Nobody's hanging out with each other. We don't want to be around each other. I don't want to be around this guy. He stinks. You know, this yeah. guy's terrible. You know, they're all talking shit about each other. It's like a it's like a bunch of kids. Yeah. They treat us like children, so they act like kids, you know? I could imagine it'd be tough if you didn't if you're busting your balls on defense and then it's three and out. Three, three and, and out, out, dude. <laughs> or <sighs> quick interception. Or like what the deep in your own territory you know it's like what the fuck well it's like okay three three four times it happens whatever we're like we can't wait to get back out there but then as a game goes on you're like dude how many opportunities are we going to give you before Mm -hmm. you just we just like accept that we're not going to win because the more opportunities that we give their offense they're going to get us figured out too yeah because it's the nfl they're all good there's been some I i think it was denver it feels like that where the defense was scoring more than the offense for a while. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I can't remember. It was remember. a Super Bowl 50 team. Yeah. Okay. It's just like. We had a couple games where we scored two, three touchdowns. <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. That's so impressive. We had guys like Aqib, man, and Von Miller. Von Miller would create strip sacks nonstop. Mm-hmm. Like, the ball was on the ground a lot. So, but guys were scooping and scoring. Um, Aqib, if that ball was, if the ball was in the air, he considered that his ball. Right. And when he got it in his hands, he wanted to score. Right. That was his mentality. He had that prime, like Deion Sanders mentality. Like, I'm trying to yeah. score. Yeah. That's uh And then man. I'm gonna steal your chain. <laughs> Dude, he is a dog. Poked a guy in the eyes once. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, out of his mind out there, but loved him. Loved yeah. having him as a teammate. Like he was a good leader as well. Hmm. 
Um, that's the other thing. You got to have a good supporting cast as a leader, right? Like when I, whenever you do say something like they got to be backing it up, you know? So like if Akib would say something, we'd all back him up. If I said something, he would back me up. Like mm-hmm. that's the kind of way it's got to be. Yeah. No, that mutual respect. Um, who is the, uh, the hardest player you've ever went against? Gave you the most trouble. <sighs> the hardest I've ever been hit was Marshawn Lynch. Hmm. My fresh, my rookie year, it was a preseason game. I've been out there for a bunch of snaps in a row. Um, Jack Del Rio was our, our defense coordinator, so he was like kind of testing me, mm-hmm. see what I was about, you know. And I was like 12 plays in a row. And I go to shed a block, and the guy kind of hangs on to me, and I didn't like finish the shed, like rip, you know, rake his arms off me. So I was kind of like exposed with my head out there, and Marshawn Lynch just like, like a big horn ram, just like, <laughs> bow! And I tackled him. But my helmet was all up in my face, yeah. and nose, and I was bleeding. And I was like, Bell my ears were wrung. ringing real yeah. bad. My chest was hurting. My back was hurting. I landed on my, I landed like kind of crooked. I was like, oh, whoa. I was like, I, that was different. Oh, man. But I just like got up, put it on. I was like, you know, then he pulled me off. And he was like, he's like, he was like welcome to the NFL, Rook. You who, know? who pulled you off? Re, Del Rio. He was oh, like, come okay. on, you're good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you remember the... What what was that uh, that run Marshawn? What was the, what they call it? The beast mode, the beast quake, the beast quake. Yeah, yeah whatever. Remember that run? I think it was Arizona or something. No, no, it's it the Saints. It's the Saints. Yeah. yeah, and he just went crazy, dude. He was an absolute animal. Yeah, it was so hard to tackle. I bet I so bet. hard to tackle. I played against a lot of good backs, man. Derek, people talk about Derrick Henry this, Derrick Henry that, but you know, and he's a great back. Yeah, but like I always made it like a personal thing against him because he you know he would like stiff arm dbs and stuff and i'm like mm-hmm. dude you're a defensive end carrying a football man like <laughs> of course huge. you can and he is huge yeah so like derrick henry he brings it like yeah. he's hard to tackle but he's got more body mass like he's tall he's so more he, upright yeah but marshawn Marshall. lynch was like <sighs> yeah it's, like and he just like kept his legs churning man he would run right through you yeah he uh that that's still like probably people love talking about that play where they didn't give it to him on the one where they tried to pass it dude and patriots won crazy that was a quarterback decision was it mm-hmm. that was wilson called that what audible out of it or something <sighs> wow that's rough i mean throws a pick and loses the so super bowl what did he did he want to get the like the stats that's an ego mm-hmm. that ego creeps in Wanted the stats to throw throw a touchdown instead of getting. He's a rush never run. had a, an MVP vote, mm. so he had to try to prove it in the Super Bowl, huh? Yep, and he tried to prove it this year, and look what happened. <sighs> you're a good, you're a great supporting quarterback. Yeah, if you don't the, try to be more than that, right? Be yourself. Be who you are. Quit yeah. trying to be somebody Play different. Play within yourself. Yeah, you got paid already, man. Like, just do it. Oh man, yeah. I mean, it's it was it was pretty. I kind of had high hopes for Denver. I've always. You know, from from when you guys played, and I was always a Von Miller fan because I knew he'd hunted, and so I was like, and then uh, Philip Lindsay because you know I had a kid, he wore some of my stuff before he was a running back there. I kind of liked, and I was like, oh shit, this would be kind of cool if if Denver could be good. And then it's just like what God, a fucking disaster. The expectations were so high, <laughs> they were, and it was such a crash and burn. Oh my God, that made it even worse. With that uh, Broncos country, let's ride. Oh, geez, dude! When he that lost was... that game, and he gets up there, and he goes, he looks like he's crying. Yeah, and he goes, Broncos country, let's ride. <laughs> oh, I it, was like, dude, it was pretty cringy. This is the cringiest thing <laughs> yes. I've ever seen. Oh, because you know he didn't even believe it at that time. No, he was like, <laughs> I can't believe I'm still saying this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> just, it just seemed brutal. Oh my god! Yeah, so. I do. I'm a Sean Payton fan, so hopefully he can get it turned yeah, around. Yeah, he's a there. good dude too. He's gonna get it together over there. You could tell. You know that I went over there for that rookie mini camp, and dude, he's got those guys. They're rolling. Locked They're gonna in. be all right. They're gonna be good to shot. Like I said, I keep saying twelve wins, and the people are like you're crazy. Ugh. Yeah. Oh, you guys were saying that last year with yeah. you know Nathaniel Hackett, who'd never been a head coach before. Right. I was like, this is a guy that knows how to do it. He did it with like all kinds of different quarterbacks. Yeah. After yeah. Drew Brees, he was doing it still. Yeah, he's a winner. Definitely a winner. He'll bring that culture like Tom Brady did kind of to Tampa Bay. Who was the player that you that you never played with that you wish or you wanted to? Is there anybody? As a teammate? Yeah. 
I mean, I just, I feel like, you know, I'm reaching there. Yeah. Tom Brady is one of those guys though. Like yeah. I would have loved to have been a teammate of his. Mm -hmm. I thought there was a chance we could get him in Denver when he went to Tampa. Yeah. Uh, no, didn't uh, work. Um, I'm thinking of some other guys. I mean, I got to play with Demarcus Ware, I know. Vaughn Miller. You got the who's who Akeem already, Talib, I guess. Peyton, Peyton Manning, Manning, Demarius Thomas. Yeah, it's like you won a Super Bowl. <laughs> won a Super Bowl, man. Like, it's it's hard for me to, like. You killed a bull elk. Killed a giant bull elk, which was like the <laughs> pinnacle of it, all of it. <laughs> Could life get any better? It seems like you've, like, for, for what you went through as a kid and your upbringing and all you had to overcome, now it seems like. Man, you've been blessed. Absolutely blessed, man. Like, I'm so grateful for the life that I get to live. Mm -hmm. Like, I get to do... My life is like a movie. Like, I get to do... So, who gets to go have a foursome golf trip with, you know, Trump and John Daly and Kid Rock? Who gets to do that, you know? Yeah, nobody I know. No, I don't know anybody. Than you. Yeah, who gets to do that? Like, I'm like, I can't believe I'm here. I was yeah. like, what am I doing here? <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> just well. this... Just a poor white trash from Ohio, you know, like, and look at where I'm at. That's what makes it so cool to see. And people, I think that's why people, because of your attitude and how, you know, you, you just share your life and share your journey. People root for you and people are happy for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nobody sees you and be like, no, fuck that guy. Why does he get all that shit? Everybody <laughs> who sees you be like, God damn. That's, he's living a great life. I'm happy for him. Well, and it's crazy because it's a, a, I get that kind of love from people that don't even know me. But when I was when I was like first in the league, guys that had seen the struggle, been there for the struggle, guys that I considered my brothers, they were trying to take advantage. Hmm. Get the money ones closest, or what? Yeah, the ones mm. closest to me. I was like, what the? Fuck? Yeah. And then, I get, and then I get married, and my wife is like, yeah, if your friends are going to come to the game, they're paying for a ticket because it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? You're right. They should have to pay for the ticket. Yeah. Because I got to pay for it. Why should I have to pay for you to come watch me? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, I get two tickets. So other than that, like. You're buying them? You're buying them. Mm. And then I guess what? Mm. Nobody came. Right. Yeah. Nobody. And then get the freebies. Somebody else When it wasn't free, it. they didn't want to come. And then for my birthday, mm. I would rent a house and have all my buddies come. And we'd, you know, hang out for a week up in the mountains and snowboard. When I stopped paying for that, nobody came. Yeah. That's a nobody came. That's a cold hard facts of life. It seems like sometimes, sometimes you, you know, it takes a little bit of, uh, I I guess when all everything's good, everybody's there. But anytime somebody has to, you know, pull themselves up or do something for themselves or pay their own way, then it's just like you really figure it out. Yeah, when everything's going good, when Peyton Manning's around and we're winning games all the time, we're going to championships. Yeah, you want to come to the games, mm -hmm. but when we're losing, you don't want to come support me. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to pay for your ticket. You don't want to do this. You want to do that. You don't want to pay for a flight. Asking me for flight money. Like, dude, you're a grown man. I'm not paying for your flight. Yeah. You got a job. You got to afford a $300 ticket. Like, come on, dude. I'm not. Yeah. It's the principle. Like, you want to come see me, bro? Like, come see me. Like, I'm not asking you. I'm not going to beg you. You know, I think it's like part of coming up from a, a situation like you did and like even like I did. It's just like people are used to not having much and like used to, um, I don't know. I, it, it just seems weird that it, it doesn't surprise me that you'd have to kind of shed those type of people yeah. because there's always going to be the hangers on for a while that aren't really grinding for themselves, but want to attach themselves to success. Mm -hmm. It kind of happens just in, in those type of environments. It but does. Eventually it, you work it out. Well, and you want to be like, I want to be around people that are like trying to grow, mm -hmm. you know, like creators, guys that are, you know, reaching for goals and shooting, you know, always evolving. Like I said, you're either getting better, or you get worse. Right. Like I never, like that worst, my worst nightmare is like working a nine to five that I hate going in, clocking out, mm -hmm. clocking in, clocking out and then living for the weekend. Right. Like, and then just, you know, hiding, going to the garage and drinking beers. So my wife doesn't see. Yeah. Like, that's like that's, my worst nightmare. That's a lot of people's lives. And a lot of people are fucking miserable. Yeah. And it's like, dude, and they're stuck. They are absolutely stuck. And I'm like, you allowed yourself to get to that. Mm -hmm. You allowed that to happen with complacency. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I started this. It's like, because I don't want to be, I want to surround myself with people like you with what I always say is outliers because you can't help but learn from people. So right. when you're around people who I, I think I, I've been lucky enough to bring people in here who are better than me at pretty much everything. And I'm like, 
if I can like get a little shine from all these people, I'm going to grow. Yeah. But it's like that growth mindset, you know, and that's what, that's what you have. That's what, you know, I like, you know, having my son be around that my family be around people like you, because it's like as a society or as a little community, it's like you can learn and evolve and have a whole different mindset from people who have done great things. Right. You know, and we can get better. We can, I don't know. It's well, I uh, appreciate you saying that because I, I learned I'm just following you in your journey on social media. Like it brings me inspiration. You inspire the shit out of me. Oh, you do, you. man. Cause like, you know why? And it doesn't matter what it is that you do. You always go as hard as you can. Try to, yeah. You always put your best foot forward. And if you fail, you fail, but you always, you're not afraid to fail. Right. And you push and you push and you push. And what you've done is you've found something you loved. You chased it f as far as you could go. And it, it hasn't slowed down yet. It just keeps getting better. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel and that is like inspirational, and anybody can learn. Anybody can do it. Yeah, anybody anybody can go and find something they love to do and fucking chase it. Right, but they're afraid to because right. they're like, oh, society says I should do this or I should do that. What or, if I? What if it does? What if? It what fails? if I fail? Yeah. What if you do fail? You'll try again, motherfucker. Go. Right. You figure something else out, <laughs> and put, if you pour yourself into whatever you're doing, there's really no no failure. You know what I mean? There's learning, mm -hmm. there's readjusting, there's re recalculating, and then just you keep going. Well, look, look at it this way. I played 10 years. How many times do you think there was a pass play in 10 years? How many pass plays were there? Thousands. Thousands. Mm -hmm. 36 sacks. I failed a lot. Right. But that didn't deter me from keep trying next play. Right. But you know what I did? I changed my tactic. Mm -hmm. I didn't keep doing the same stupid ass move that didn't work the time before. Right. I didn't not run to the ball and try to get, you know, create a, a sack fumble or do something, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the thing, man. And when you go hard and you play hard and you work hard, things will happen. Good things will happen. Right. That's just like the law of attraction, right? Like if I keep like putting it out there that like this is going to happen, but I'm not doing anything about it. Right. Probably not going to happen. No. But if I'm putting it out there and I keep going and I keep going and I never waver from that and there's going to be days where you're like, man, fuck this. Like every that's, that's natural to feel that way, to mm -hmm. be like, man, this is just not going to work, man. I should just quit. And that's just like that little voice in your head that you got to tell the fuck off. Yeah. Get out of here. No, I'm going to keep going. Wake up the next day before your feet hit the ground. Be like, I'm going to win today. I'm going to win today. I'm going to win today. And you might not. Yeah. But you're going to keep trying. That's, Eventually it's going to work out for you, man. It's like, that's a rare mindset. It is. You know why? Because people, people would rather have an excuse. Mm -hmm. They would rather it be easy. They have social media where it looks like everybody's doing well, but it's not real. Social mm -hmm. media is not real. Like the shit that you see in there is not real. You know, I mean, these, these kids these days, man, they don't even have, they have not the first clue of how to even con have a conversation with each other. Right. Right. Like it's, it's sad. No, they, people do put a lot of power into what they see on a glimpse of highlights or what's not really curated existence that's not even a, a real life but um yeah i mean i i like your approach on yeah you get up i'm gonna win the day doesn't matter if i failed yesterday or yesterday was a fucking disaster we're gonna give her all we got today have a short memory and i've never i've never seen anybody who gives all they got to something fail eventually they win eventually they fucking win <laughs> eventually this, it's going to work <laughs> out and all that effort is going to pay off but what happens is people get yeah f one little speed bump one little hurdle and they're like oh oh see i told you yeah told I mean, you i couldn't I knew do this it this is going to happen this always happens i think this starts with with i'm going to go out on a limb here and say it starts with parenting mm -hmm. or lack thereof because if you if your parents allow you to quit once the next time would be really easy right <clears throat> we don't let our kids quit mm -hmm. no you're not you're not going to quit if you start it we're going to finish it until there's no there's no rope left right you keep trying we're going to keep trying we'll find another way but nowadays these kids are like you know their parents are instead of like problem solving they just toss an ipad at them right you know so now they grew up just like playing video games and watching movies and this and that, and they don't live in the real world. So they get out in the real world and they're shocked. 
what? I can't make a hundred thousand a year just like showing up. Right. No, bud, you got to work hard. And I don't have a million dollars. Why? I don't know. Probably because you don't do anything. The, what sucks is that the kids see that behavior and they emulate it because they see their parents quit. They, they hear their parents complaining and whining about things and quitting when things get yeah. hard. So, of course, they're going to be the same. Yeah. So it's like it's, you know, a lot of parents will say, do as I say, not as I do. No, no. Nope. You got to fucking lead by example, lead by example. And a lot of parents don't. They, they, want, don't. they expect their kids to do something great when they haven't and they haven't pushed themselves they haven't challenged themselves but they expect their kids to it's never going to work right that's what you know that's like don't don't you want your kids to see you like grind and work for something you know Mm -hmm. every great story think about every great story you hear about like uh you know like basketball players football players they always talk about like a single mom they talk about how my mom had three jobs and still cooked us dinner and did this and did that that's what inspired them right that grind like, inspired them. That hunger. Like, I, not not the, not the sitting on your ass and complaining mm-hmm. and whining. Coming home and showing love and getting your ass up and going to work again, doing what you got to do. Exactly. And that's what it's about. Well, what's, uh, so in that in that vein, what's your goals? What's, what next for so, Derek Wolf? So there's, so I really would like to take, I want my podcast to take off. Um, you know, I was picking your brain earlier about it. Like, I don't want to do it and do it wrong. Mm-hmm. I want to, I want to figure out all I can figure out and then I can make a, a decision. Cause it's like, I don't know what I don't know. Right. So I'm like, I got my studio set up. I got my YouTube channel going. I got films out already. Um, I just, I love to hunt. Mm-hmm. So I want to hunt and I want to make a living doing it. Like I want it to pay for itself at least. And it is already, you know, year one, I earned enough to to make it pay beyond for itself, you know, which is like kind of blew my mind. I didn't have a product yet. And I was like, okay, imagine when I really get this thing going, you know? So, um, the podcasting, the hunting, and then, um, I'm thinking about doing a little WWE. Really? Thinking about it. Nice. Thinking about it. I got to get some feelers out. Do they pay well? well? I don't know. Okay. (laughs) You got, Hey, I don't know. You got the look. I feel like I'd be great at it. I think so. I'd be a great guy at, at going out there and, Getting the crowd route up, doing some backflips. You're good on the mic? Yeah, talking shit. I just, mean, no, I mean, that's a big part of, <laughs> it is. of that stuff. Is you got to like be able to talk. Yeah. yeah, you can't, like, a, a big group of people doesn't, like, intimidate me to speak to them, you know? Yeah. And I think that it, that is a really big there. Um, you know, I'm also doing um, some speaking, so I get paid to go and I never thought that I would be a, in like a, what do you call it, a, a motivational speaker, right, right? Yeah, yeah. I never thought that I would do something like that because I always thought that like those guys were kind of corny to me. Mm-hmm. But I don't write those speeches. I just go in there and speak from the heart. Yeah, and talk to like, I, your what do you guys do for a living? Yeah, let me show you how you can apply exactly how I lived to what you're doing. I don't care if you're in real estate, whatever. But I'm, you know, I'm doing some public speaking too for and uh, and getting paid to do it, talking to kids and. You know, talking to adults, like all ages, age groups can kind of learn from like the things that I've applied in my life and how I got to where I'm at yeah. and how I continue to try to grow. I didn't just retire from the NFL and be like, oh, I give up now. I'm done, which yeah. I could. I made enough money. I could just, right. I could just say, you know, screw it and just, you know, I'm going to, this is the life I'm going to live. And, but that's not, what's the purpose? Yeah. Is that good for my kids to see? No. You, you don't ha- you don't have a coasting type spirit. You no, know what I, I mean? Can't. You fought your whole life. You're going to continue to fight and I work. need some adversity. Yeah. I need to be doing something where people are like, you can't do it. Right. You know, we were talking about that earlier, right? When I was like, I'd rather somebody tell me I can't do something than tell me I'm going to be good at it. You know? <laughs> me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I have no doubt that I, if I look at everything you've accomplished so far, there's no doubt that you're going to continue to be successful in your life. And I mean, you're just set up for it. Your mindset is that growth mindset, that winning mindset. And you bring, you bring a positive spirit to, I mean, the time we spent together today, I, I see that you positively influence others because you have me and I appreciate you coming. I, Thank you for coming all the way to Oregon, sharing in my lift run shoot experience, taking time out to podcast. It means so much to me. I'm dude, I, I'm honored, dude. I'm honored. Seriously, like I know it sounds cheesy, but like it's an absolute honor to like be around you, to learn from you, to watch how you do, how you do this shit every day. I mean, you got an unbelievable concept here. A great team around you, great family. I mean, uh, you know, I'm I'm impressed, man. It's super cool, 
And, uh, you know, I'm grateful for your friendship and for your leadership as well. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, I'll end this with, uh, you know, I think you're an ally. I appreciate you coming. Normally I give my guests a bow, but you already have your own bow and I don't have a 33 inch bow for you, but you're shooting so good, but thank you very much. I appreciate you. Thanks for coming, Derek. Thanks for having me, brother. All right. Keep hammering. Every step I take, I move my truth. Every time they tell me stop, I use. Every comment, hate that makes my feel. Gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with. Giving my blood so I am relentless. My fault, they want someone to blame. They sent their hate, it fuels my pace. I am Roy Tough. I am the change, the few endure. Feeling like Cam Haynes. Oh. Nobody wants, I'll give you my heart, I'll yeah. give you the